we shall start. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, I'm Joe Lascalzo, and on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to welcome you to this second international conference on network medicine and big data. As you know, this conference has been in the planning stage for almost two years. Following our very successful first conference in Rome in 2018, our original intention was to hold a second conference here in Boston in 2020. The pandemic that's affected all of us in so many ways caused a delay that ultimately led to our putting together this virtual conference one year behind schedule. We have a superb group of speakers lined up for this conference who cover a wide range of topics related to network medicine and big data from biology and medicine to statistical physics and computer science. I am most grateful to them for their participation. We also have a, a, a large pool of attendees, uh, numbering uh, 250 who registered for the program, also representing an equally wide range of disciplines. With this group of speakers and attendees, I, I expect that our, we'll have a rich discussion of topics and great opportunities for collaboration uh, should evolve. A few housekeeping comments. Um, please note that each ses session will be led by two co-chairs. The co-chairs will keep the speakers to the allotted time, uh, generally 15 minutes each for, with five minutes of discussion. We'll also have a longer discussion period at the end of each session. Kindly submit all questions through the chat function, which is essential for efficiency given the size of the audience. And one of the co-chairs will ask your questions uh, of the speaker. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the members of the planning committee uh, Ed Silverman, Sebastiano Folletti, Harold Schmidt, Paola Velardi, Enrico Petrillo for their terrific suggestions, and Rose Canestraro, who worked with each of you to facilitate scheduling and put together the conference book, uh, which includes abstracts of all the talks and contact information. This booklet's available online in PDF format for your, uh, your access. Let me now welcome Dean George Daly, the Dean of Harvard Medical School who's kindly agreed to offer opening comments as we begin the conference. Dean Daly, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and as you said, good morning or good afternoon. Um, I certainly would uh, welcome an invitation to the next time your meeting is held in, uh, in Italy. <laughs> but wherever you are, welcome. And I'm delighted that we could all come together, uh, even though it's virtually, for what promised to be an exceptional conference. Uh, just looking at the agenda, uh, I was tremendously impressed, even inspired by the work that uh, you're all doing, the tremendous progress that we've made. Um, you know, just for a few examples, taking great fascination with the work of uh, Albert Laszlo Barabasi uh, on networks and the food home. Uh, it wasn't long ago that he first actually coined the term network medicine in the 2007 Nijam article on obesity and the disease zone. And since then, it's really been extraordinary. The study of the biological networks um, really have taken center stage. And um, my own lab has been involved in areas of systems biology, um, being able to understand the complexities of gene regulation to uh, map protein-protein interaction, and then understand the, the network activities, the interplays across these networks of genes. It's all progressed very, very fast. And I think it's absolutely clear if we just look at the last year that this expanding universe of knowledge uh, has aided the way that we've been able to understand the coronavirus. The remarkable rapidity with which we've been able to decipher the virus's patterns of spread, its behavior, uh, both outside and inside the human host. Um, it's really network medicine, network biology that's allowed us to be so swift in decoding the mechanisms of infection and replication, uh, the interactions with various tissues, organs, organ systems. And it's clear that this insight has been uh, ushering in uh, new approaches to treatments uh, and vaccines. And, we have all witnessed, I think marveled at medical history un unfolding over this past year. You know, but as we enter the second year of the pandemic, we look ahead, we see on the horizon 
the ever greater need for more discoveries uh, to come from the kind of work that all of you do, um, teamwork, uh, networks. One example I want to highlight is some of the work that we've done here at Harvard Medical School in something called the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, which we call Mass CPR. This is uh, anchored at Harvard Medical School, but it's a multi-institutional alliance that includes both US-based as well as international collaborators, including uh, my, my partner Fabio Cicciari from San Raffaele in, in Milano. Um, we have engaged a wide variety of clinicians and scientists across multiple disciplines, uh, across academia and industry. And the mass CPR has been a marvel of collaboration uh, across institutional boundaries, but geographic boundaries as well. And the efforts of this group are aimed at turning the tide of the pandemic and laying the foundation for a rapid response to address future emerging pathogens. Now, a few weeks ago, the Mass CPR convened some of its uh, top flight virologists, immunologists, infectious disease experts. We held a couple of different public briefings, uh, in particular, one briefing on the SARS-CoV-2 variants. Now, some of our scientists have uh, been intensely studying these variants and understanding that um, both structurally and evolutionarily, how these variants are evolving resistance to both naturally occurring antibody-based immunity, but also the, the various uh, antibodies that are in, uh, in commercial use uh, by the likes of Regeneron and Lilly. Um, another recent study from some of our researchers revealed that vaccine-induced antibodies may also be less effective against certain of the viral variants of concern. Now, these findings suggest that uh, reassuringly, while current vaccines remain effective against the current variants, there's heightened concern that next wave viral mutations could escape the immune control with existing vaccines. With the most concerning scenario, being a second pandemic, COVID 2.0. Now, these concerns are really a call to action. They're an early warning that should inform our efforts to forecast and prepare for the virus's next moves. And to do this, we're taking advantage of the wealth of genomic, epidemiologic, structural data that are now available. And these insights help us to refine the current treatments and to design the next generation of vaccines that could include broad mechanisms of immune protection. Now our growing ability to study the interactions between disease entities to analyze disease networks is giving us critical edge in the battle against COVID-19, the many diseases that are sure to follow. Now as devastating as it has been, the pandemic has also provided many opportunities to deploy some of the highly predictive tools that you all have been working so hard to develop. As a result, we have learned a tremendous amount about the structure of SARS-CoV-2, how it invades cells, how it behaves inside the human host, how it affects various organs and inflicts damage on them. The knowledge is also helping us to identify whether we can repurpose existing drugs to combat the virus, and also will illuminate the design of novel drugs. Now this rapidly accumulating clinical data coupled with insights into the pathobiology, the pathoimmunology of COVID-19 are also helping us to understand how the virus affects various organ systems beyond the lungs, including the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the endocrine system. COVID is really a multi-system disease. And interestingly, it's all of you, the network-based scientists who are coming together to work collaboratively, who have fostered so much of this extraordinary progress. Now, just to highlight a few here at HMS, Marina Zitnik in the HMS Department of Biomedical Informatics used um, machine learning to help Dr. Barabasi's group at Northeastern 
to sift through data on potential drugs that could be repurposed for treatment of COVID-19. And both of them worked closely with our leader, Joe Lascalzo, on narrowing down drug candidates, eliminating those that could be potentially toxic or uh, difficult to administer. Quantitative approaches to network-based analysis, computation, genomics, big data, they're converging like never before to push the frontiers of discovery and to transform medicine. The evolving field of biomedical research around network medicine is deepening our understanding of biological mechanisms of cellular, molecular, gene network functions, but also dysfunction and are revolutionizing the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And that is thanks to all of you and what you're bringing together. So last year it was work with big data that helped us predict who would test positive for SARS-CoV-2. A group of researchers sifting through data shared by millions of individuals who logged onto phone apps to report their symptoms, identified the loss of smell and taste as a telltale sign of infection. Andrew Chan, a physician epidemiologist here at the Mass General, was a lead researcher on that COVID-19 system tra uh, symptom tracker project. The app gave us the ability to rapidly collect data on large populations of individuals, allowing for real-time collection of information in the midst of a rapidly unfolding pandemic. The data collected also helped us understand the risks that healthcare workers were facing and the disease amplifying effects of underlying conditions such as obesity and diabetes. You have all been leading the way. Researchers around the world are following suit, aggregating large data sets that are then being broken down using AI and ML. These data sets have yielded insights that may help us untangle the mystery of long haul COVID-19 and give us the ability to treat the lingering post disease syndromes. Now leveraging the tools and the resources of big data and computational science promises to transform the way clinical basic and translational science is done in the future. The National COVID Cohort Collaborative here in the United States supported by our National Institutes of Health, has been collecting information from electronic health records of patients who've tested positive for COVID-19 or who have reported COVID-19 symptoms. The information they've been able to gather is helping to shape numerous endeavors. And these initiatives are laying the groundwork for a time when we will routinely use big data to understand all kinds of health outcomes. Now this will require ongoing collaboration and cooperation. And we are moving inexorably toward that day. And that is a truly exciting development in the future of medicine. So network medicine, big data, allowing us to decipher the complexity of the human body, its myriad interactions, and to explore the many and varied factors that influence equilibrium and disequilibrium in illness and health integration of modern computational biomedicine, data science, bioinformatics, and systems analysis is leading us to larger answers and greater understanding in our quest to treat disease and to preserve health. My own lab has gone in this direction, as I've said, and I am tremendously inspired by the work that you are all doing and will continue to do. It has never been more important. So I thank you for coming together here today to share your knowledge, to enlighten each other for the common good. Enjoy your conference. Thank you, Joe, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, George. Thanks for those very inspiring remarks. We very much appreciate them. So uh, let's uh, then proceed to the first session, the general principle session, and uh, Paula Velardi and I will co-chair this session. Uh, Paula, you're on mute and mute myself. Uh, I must say that this is my first time as a remote chair and I have two wishes. The wishes, wishes number one is it, it is also my last time as a remote chair so that we can keep again meeting in presence. And uh, the second wish is that if this comes true, part of the merit is also of this wonderful community. So 
Um, it is a, a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this, of this session. Uh, and I know that all of you uh, know who the first speaker is, but let me be a little formal. Uh, and let me introduce Professor Joseph Luscalzo, who is the head of the Department of Medicine and Brigham Women's Unit Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And he is the one without whom all this would not be possible. Uh, the title of his talk is um, Interactum Variants, Personalized Reticulotypes and Precision Medicine. So Joseph, it is your turn. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paula. I will uh, share my screen. Right. Okay. Well, it's a, a pleasure to speak with you today. And um, I wanna begin by saying that the work I'm gonna share with you represents uh, the work of many people. Uh, and I'll name them as we proceed through the presentation. I really want to set the stage for this and subsequent sessions uh, in part with updates that have evolved since our last meeting, but also to highlight the uh, extreme uh, uh, energy, enthusiasm, and excitement that's gone on to the evolution of this field. And I wanna begin also by thanking Laszlo Barabasi without whom this whole uh, discipline wouldn't have evolved. And our partnership over the last many years has been extraordinarily productive and fruitful and intellectually stimulating. So let's move on. My disclosures relevant to this talk are listed here. So the question, the basic question is, can macromolecular interaction networks define genomic context and give us unique insights into the pathogenesis of disease and potential precision therapies? So the fundamental hypothesis is depicted in this sketch uh, from a review that uh, Laszlo and I published in 2011 that set the stage for this notion of disease modules within the protein-protein interaction network. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with this concept. It really percolates through the entire uh, session, but just to review it briefly, on the left here, we have a uh, generic interactome uh, showing all ascertainable protein-protein interactions. And within this interactome, the hypothesis has been that there are disease neighborhoods within which disease modules sit. Now, what does this mean? And how do we pose the hypothesis more formally? Well, there are really four features to the hypothesis for hypotheses that define the organizational principles tying the interactome to human disease. And these were reviewed nicely uh, recently by uh, Paolo Pacci in a publication this year. There's the local hypothesis, namely that proteins involved in the same disease tend to interact. There's the disease module hypothesis that proteins involved in the same disease cluster in connected subnetworks, as I showed in the last slide. There's the functional coherence hypothesis that proteins in a disease module are often involved in the same biological process. And there's the shared components hypothesis that related diseases are located in the same interactome neighborhood from which unrelated diseases are separated. Obviously, some of these are corollaries of each other and uh, they basically uh, uh, effectively emphasize the importance of localization of proteins that govern phenotypic features of a disease. So in 2015, Jörg Menke uh, and colleagues, uh, Laszlo, uh, uh, our group, uh, published this uh, paper that really demonstrated for the first time that the disease module hypothesis is correct. That uh, if one looks at the curation of all experimentally validated PPIs in the human cell forming the human interactome, which at that time had about 13,500 proteins and 140,000 edges, one could find that diseases tended to cluster. The proteins governing those diseases tended to cluster in subnetworks or modules. And three of them are illustrated here, peroxisomal disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis. 
And notice that rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis modules overlap to some extent, uh, not, not surprising given that both have autoimmune underpinnings. So how does one uh, create or derive a disease module? Well, here's a, a formalism for doing so that, uh, that we and others have used. Uh, this is for cerebrovascular disease. We first identified the disease phenotype of interest and then ascertained the disease network components called seed proteins shown in blue here. We mapped the seed proteins to the interactome and then identify the disease modules within the interactome network, determining whether or not they truly are uh, clustered rather than randomly scattered throughout the interactome. And what allows for that disease module definition are the connector proteins shown in gray. So as a result of uh, this uh, approach, we rec recognize that the interactome offers or provides the missing links among disease-associated proteins that were not necessarily ascertainable using conventional reductionist uh, experimentation. Now, I mentioned that uh, disease modules are separated from each other when they have distinct and different uh, drivers, but it's also true that some disease modules overlap, as illustrated here, when they have some common uh, mechanistic determinants. Here we see the modules for asthma and celiac disease. And as you can see, the immune network for IgA production provides an area of overlap between those modules. Not surprising for those who understand the biology, but not really previously demonstrated in such a uh, precise way. Now, more recently, uh, Andre Semekin working with Brad Marin, uh, explored the fibrosis endophenotype. Remember endophenotypes from our perspective today are those mechanistic features that drive all human disease like uh, uh, cell proliferation or apoptosis, inflammation, thrombosis, and fibrosis. And here Andre and Brad were interested in distinguishing between adaptive and pathogenic fibrosis. Adaptive being a normal fibrotic response following injury, pathogenic reflecting an abnormal proliferation of interstitial tissue, collagen in particular, and fibroblasts that promote disease. And there are many diseases in which one finds pathogenic fibrosis. Brad's specific interest here is in pulmonary vascular disease. Uh, he had also shown previously that aldosterone promotes uh, fibrosis. And there is, as you can see in C, an aldosterone fib fibrosome subnetwork, which really is derived from looking at the interactions between the molecular or protein determinants of the aldosterone response uh, that are linked to the pathogenic determinants of fibrosis. Those determinants are shown in B. The adaptive genes or proteins are shown in blue, the pathogenic in red, and the adaptive and pathogenic, that is the overlapping proteins, are shown in blue with the red border. So looking at these interactive features, they then explored those proteins that had high between the centrality between adaptive and pathogenic fibrosis. And one that, uh, that was, was identified and had not previously been recognized as important in fibrosis is the scaffold protein NED9. What they were able to show in this really elegant paper is that TGF beta dependent signaling uh, can lead to NED9 expression, which can undergo oxidation as a consequence of aldosterone stimulation or activation, which in turn uh, leads to enhanced expression of collagen, collagen type three in particular, promoting in this case, pathogenic perivascular fibrosis. So I, I took a little time to explain this complicated, but really uh, quite nice uh, uh, illustration of the utility of exploring the complexity of networks to, dis to discern disease mechanisms. And there are many examples of disease mediators being defined uh, as a result of the exploration <coughs> of these, uh, these disease modules. And I, I have summarized them here. You can uh, explore the details of each uh, 
by way of the, um, uh, of the references, but they range widely from determinants of aortic valvular calcification, Schlatter's work in circulation, to the to, uh, drivers of preeclampsia, that is the overlap of the vitamin D receptor module and the IL-10 module, the work of Mirzakhani and Scott Weiss, who just reviewed um, uh, uh, the Samican paper on pulmonary arterial hypertension and perivascular fibrosis, NED9's role in it. Uh, the late Amitabh Sharba uh, explored uh, or identified NFATC4 as a critical regulatory determinant of type 2 diabetes and GAB1 as a determinant of, um, of insensitivity, steroid resistance among asthmatics. Uh, these, uh, these studies all have one thing in common. They basically begin with the disease module and explore pathways within it as a way to explain a phenotype. We're well, gonna talk a little bit uh, in a moment about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as yet another example of this approach. But we've, before we do so, let's, let's turn to the protein-protein interaction network and, and consider how genetics modulates those protein-protein interactions as a mechanism by which to explain dysfunctional uh, mutations, both in germline and somatic-based uh, uh, diseases. Uh, this is work uh, Fei Xiong Chang um, performed that was uh, published earlier this year. And what Fei Xiong did was he looked at disease-causing mutations in the HGMD, and he was able to demonstrate for those, um, uh, those proteins whose tertiary structures were known and whose interface relationships to binding partners were known, was able to demonstrate that the likelihood of finding a mutation at interface uh, 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 regions as compared to non-interface regions was, was much higher when uh, germline mutations were uh, analyzed than in one KGP or exact. There's about a fourfold difference in the frequency of interface mutations uh, as compared to non-interface mutations. So these interface regions, which define the fundamental basis uh, molecularly for the PPI, uh, these interface regions really uh, are critical in govern governing the genetic consequences of mutations that lead to disease phenotypes. Beishong also looked at missense somatic mutations among 30 different cancers from the Cancer Genome Atlas and found a similar difference between those mutations at the interface versus the non-interface, about a four to six fold increase in the frequency of interface mutations compared with non-interface mutations. So clearly the PPI is more than just a, um, a structural depiction of potential interactions between proteins. More importantly, it also reflects the template upon which uh, various, both germline and somatic mutations exercise their adverse consequences for disease evolution. Now let's talk a little, we've been talking about, if you will, sort of effects, local effects within the PPI, but there are also effects at a distance, if you will, uh, that reflect differential gene expression governed by, uh, for example, uh, transcription factors. So in, in this uh, work uh, by Paola Pacci um, uh, and Lorenzo Farina, uh, they were able to demonstrate that if one combines disease-specific tra transcriptomic data with the interactome using their uh, SWIM analysis, which uh, I believe that Paola will talk a little bit about in her presentation, these are switch genes which govern transitions, state transitions in, uh, in, in disease evolution. That when one combines disease specific transcriptomic data and the interactome, one can uh, begin to create what we ultimately called a swim informed human disease network. And this network reflects what I prefer to call effects at a distance because these transcriptional features act over a greater, if you will, Euclidean ranges within the interactome that, um, that may or may not uh, involve specifically the, a particular disease module. In her analysis, uh, Paula uh, 
explored uh, mechanisms by which to identify the importance of these uh, transcriptomic disease state transitions within the interactome. And uh, just to summarize, here she so shows a disease switch gene network for four different diseases. You can see how discrete they are from one another in the interactome. She, uh, she developed a generalized measure of module separation uh, that could then be applied to the assessment of overlap or distance uh, between different um, modules, switch gene modules. The SWIM-based disease dendrogram and heat map um, was created and, uh, and then ultimately this switch gene informed human disease network was generated within which each node now is a disease, not a protein. And the size of the node corresponds to the number of switch genes that regulate it. The color in turn corresponds to the disease class. Here you can see in, um, in greenish, uh, the uh, class of uh, cancers to tumors. Uh, the edges in this case indicate overlap um, in switch genes. So that uh, we now can explore yet another uh, formalism for understanding uh, network relationships among uh, diseases and disease determinants as governed by transcriptional regulation. Well, the system can get even more complicated if you begin to look at uh, network, other networks of networks as uh, Liu and uh, late Amitabh Sharma did in this uh, paper published earlier this year. Here they were interested in multi-layer cascading failure in, in, in macromolecular and molecular interaction networks. And what they, this is a, 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 a theoretical analysis in which they looked at a gene regulatory network, a PPI and a metabolic network and their coupling. They knocked out um, a gene as shown by the black ellipse and the gene regulatory network. That's the initial perturbation. Then the target genes fail, these black ellipses, throughout the regulatory network and depending upon their relationship to that initially perturbed gene. And the corresponding proteins that are governed uh, by those uh, transcription factors in turn uh, are also eliminated. These are the black tripod shapes in the PPI. And then ultimately the LCC fails and metabolites are eliminated as shown by the conversion of the green uh, uh, molecular icons to gray icons in the metabolic layer. Um, what they were able to show in this uh, analysis is that the fraction of functional metabolic nodes following the perturbation was different for randomly perturbed uh, nodes or regulatory uh, uh, genes versus targeted uh, nodes. Uh, as illustrated in blue versus uh, red here in, uh, in the graph. Now, this isn't surprising. It basically is a feature of clustered networks as, uh, as you would expect. And as uh, Laszlo showed years ago um, in, this, in the analysis of the sensitivity or robustness of scale-free networks to perturbations. But it demonstrates this point nicely uh, among these in this complex network of networks for the disease determinants in which we're interested. Now let's uh, return to this issue of, um, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I uh, touched on a few slides ago and begin this part of the presentation by uh, reminding you about this notion of convergent phenotypes. So convergent phenotypes really reflect our inability to phenotype properly and in a, in, with fine precision. But we now as physicians, often identify patients with uh, what uh, is a disease phenotype that could, could be caused by many different disorders. Here's one example of that disease phenotype, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the left ventricle is, walls are very thickened. There are many different disorders which can cause this macroscopic uh, abnormality, including mutations in more than 11 sarcomeric proteins with more than 1400 variants, causing the genetically determined hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype. Uh, but it can also be caused by untreated hypertension, aortic stenosis when not, uh, not adequately treated, and, in, and infiltrative diseases like Fabry's disease and Pompe's disease. There are other uh, convergent cardiovascular phenotypes, 
like thrombotic microangiopathy that can also evolve from many different disorders. But here we're interested in HCM and in a really a very nice work that uh, Brad and Rusheng Wang uh, uh, completed and published earlier this year. They um, uh, explore this notion of individual networks, or as I call them, individual reticulotypes after the Latin for network in HCM patients. And they did so by looking at differential gene expression in patients with disease versus normals. The normals were obtained from rejected donor hearts. These were healthy controls. Hearts weren't used because of sizing issues largely. Uh, they uh, obtained RNA-seq data, data from that tissue, tissue and then created a Pearson correlation matrix. Similarly, they took uh, 18 myectomy samples. One of the treatments for HCM is to excise a portion of the septum between the left and right ventricle to minimize obstruction to the outflow of blood from the left ventricle and, uh, and analyze the RNA-seq data from that tissue. And then with each patient, they explored the consequences of the differences in uh, transcriptomic expression against the uh, Pearson correlation matrix. They perturbed that matrix uh, one by each. And they identified statistically significant changes between these pairs of collected uh, expressed genes and gene pairs mapped to the PPI. And as a result, they were able to create when um, uh, uh, mapping it to the consolidated uh, PPI, an individual HCM patient network. And you're not expected to see the details of these networks, but here are 18 of them for the 18 patients they analyzed. And I think from a distance, you can see that many uh, seem to be quite different. Some are very dense, others are less so. And one can explore uh, those, uh, those, uh, uh, those proteins and pathways that are unique to patients in, in an effort to try to identify the specific phenotypes that may be more or less predominant in a particular patient. And with that kind of approach, they were able to identify myocardial fibrosis and fibrosis nodes with unique, that is patient specific edges within these individual reticulotypes. Here you can see the correlation between interstitial collagen as a marker of fibrosis and the fibrosis pathway involvement as measured by unique edges for each network. And there's a strong, there's a strong a direct correlation. Uh, this analysis also led to their identifying a unique drug target uh, that hadn't been previously recognized, the JAK-STAT target uh, for the potential treatment of such patients. So this to me, this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation really uh, uh, provides a true advance in the direction of precision medicine on a network basis. And that's ultimately our goal here, to go from genotype to phenotype by way of the reticulotype and the personalized interactome, which governs the differences, subtle and not so subtle, in phenotypes among different individuals. Now in the last five or 10 minutes, let's talk a little bit about, um, about network-based approaches to drug discovery. And we have a whole session devoted to, to this tomorrow, this concept tomorrow. But I'll remind you of, uh, of Ehrlich and his magic bullet theory. Uh, here he is in his office, uh, thinking about his low throughput um, uh, drug uh, uh, analysis. He really was the first uh, chemical biologist he, I, he was responsible for creating the typical drug discovery strategy and platform that we all use, that pharma has used for the last hundred years. Um, his efforts were really derived from observations on the tissue selectivity of dyes, which evolved to incorporate this notion of the side chain theory of immunospecificity. Now remember that this notion of specific receptors as an outgrowth of the side chain theory was not predicated on, on any identification of specific receptors that didn't occur until about 50 years later. But it, um, it really held fast and connected chemistry with biology and medicine uh, that really has uh, led to uh, many advances in, in pharmacology. But clearly modern pharmacology suffers from many failings 
uh, contemporary clinical trial design uh, paradigms are notable for their, um, their weak effects, if you will. The average clinical response rates of all of the FDA approved drugs is about 25%. 42% of approved drugs in 2018 were based on a single pivotal trial. And in this slide, uh, adapted from Sure, courtesy of Harold Schmidt, um, uh, you can see that for every individual a drug helps among the 10 highest sales drugs in the US, um, uh, they fail to help between three and 24 individuals. So we're really working at the extreme right end of the, of the distribution, response distribution, with most patients being terribly underserved by the drugs that are often quite expensive uh, that we use. Now, another important concept to remember is that drugs are promiscuous, small molecule as well as monoclonal antibodies. This is a, a distribution of the number of targets for about 470 FDA approved drugs. I uh, created this, this, this graph from data from Chartier and colleagues published in 2017. And they asked the simple question, uh, for those, uh, those drugs and drug targets for which the binding site is known, how often is that binding site recapitulated in the human proteome? And as you can see, uh, on average uh, of these 470 drugs, there are 32 targets per drug. And it's a very long tail distribution. Most drugs have many targets. And that, that creates an enormous number of problems, not the least of which is off-target effects that could be adverse failure to recognize the potential use of these drugs for other diseases because drugs are developed with blinders on, focus on a specific disease, identify a single target and drug the target. And of course, the other problem is that when there's so many other targets, uh, th this will likely affect the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics because these other targets serve as sinks that minimize the availability or could serve as sinks uh, that minimize the availability of the drug for the true target. And if you, if you, you know, consider just those, those three issues, you can, you can understand why most, uh, most drugs fail at some point in their development. Now the two strategies of drug target identification, there's a um, uh, not necessarily only network-based, but drug target ID strategy identify the target in a pathway that you understand and can, and can monitor, and then uh, screen your, uh, your uh, proprietary pool of drugs for those that have the greatest effect with the appropriate pharmacokinetics. <clears throat> but another approach, and this is relevant to repurposing drugs, uh, is the network-based drug repurposing proximity hypothesis, which is to say that if one has a disease module shown in pale blue here, within which there are drug targets for drugs that are known to treat that disease, but adjacent to which are other drug targets that are only one or two edges away from the disease module with drugs that are used to treat another disease. One could ask the question, could those same drugs be used to treat this disease for which those drugs were not developed? And, um, uh, Sorry. And uh, uh, one example of, uh, of how one can approach that repurposing comes from work that uh, Jun Sop Song and Jane Leopold just uh, published last year, in which they explored the calcification, in this case, vascular calcification endophenotype. They created the endophenot calcification endophenotype module shown here on the left and identified some unique uh, drug targets within that module for which there were drugs used to treat other diseases. And three uh, stood out as interesting for, uh, for experimental analysis, the, uh, the mTOR inhib inhibitors, everolimus and temsorolimus, as well as the thalidomide congener homolidomide. And they were able to sh show in an in vitro assay that each of these agents could re significantly reduce calcification uh, the use of these drugs in, uh, in mo animal models of calcification awaits further experimentation. But that um, example illustrates this point of the use utility of repurposing. Another example of the utility of repurposing comes from work of Feishang Chang and 
in conjunction with uh, 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 Sebastian Schneebeis and Rishi Desai with Laszlo in, in our group, Diane Handy. And in this work, uh, we asked the question, could you repurpose approved drugs for coronary artery disease? And how can one assess the utility of those repurposed drugs? So the way this question was approached was first to identify drugs used for the treatment of other diseases whose targets were near or within the coronary artery disease, disease module uh, that also had comparators used to treat the same disease whose targets were well remote, removed from the coronary disease module. So with those, uh, those pairs in hand, and I'll just focus on carbamazepine and any epilep epilepsy drug compared to levetiracetam and hydroxychloroquine, uh, versus leflunamide. These are immune modulating drugs used in autoimmune diseases. Uh, uh, Rishi Desai and Sebastian Schneeweiss first explored the over 200 million uh, uh, individuals in these administrative databases for the uh, uh, incidence of new coronary disease events following the initiation of treatment with one or the other of these pairs of drugs. And what they were able to demonstrate is that in fact, levetiracetam increased the risk of coronary disease events, whereas, uh, I'm sorry, carbamazepine increased the risk of coronary disease events by about 40 to 50%, whereas hydroxychloroquine reduced the risk of coronary disease events by about 40 to 45% compared to their uh, non-module target related uh, 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 similar ag similarly used agents, levetiracetam and leflunamide, respectively. So now we used big, big data to uh, explore uh, the possible relationship to clinical events uh, in, uh, with these pairs of drugs. And then we returned to the experimental lab where Diane Handy explored the possible mechanisms by which, in this case, hydroxychloroquine could benefit uh, the risk of evolving atherothrombotic disease. And she did so by uh, recognizing that there are uh, two of hydroxychloroquine's drug targets, TLR7 and TLR9, uh, which uh, through their network relationships can likely affect the expression of inflammatory um, mediators like the adhesion molecule BKM1 um, or the inflammatory inhibitor NOS3 she was able to show that hydroxychloroquine could, in fact, in response to TNF stimulation of VCAM or IL-1 beta or suppression of uh, NOS3, that hydroxychloroquine could reverse, not completely, but reverse these uh, abnormal responses uh, to TNF. So the, this is not the only mechanism by which hydroxychloroquine may be, may be exercising its benefit, but it is, um, uh, one, it is at least one potential explanation for its, its advantageous use. So that, that leads to a broader ongoing project uh, with Felice Lightstone, who'll be uh, presenting tomorrow. Uh, Felice uh, leads the uh, biology efforts, the structural biology efforts at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Uh, whose Sierra system uh, computes at near exascale and through support from the American Heart Association and the de de Department of Energy, uh, we have the Center for Accelerated D Drug Discovery there. And the plan is to explore in an unbiased way uh, uh, all potential drug target interactions in the human proteome for proteins whose tertiary structures are known. And in the first pass, uh, Felice is using about uh, 28,600 models for 14,000 proteins, uh, many of which are derived from experimental structures, some from congeners. Um, she is uh, screening a 2 million compound open access library from these sources and will be creating a large uh, small molecule target matrix from which we can explore potential repurposable uses to which many of these uh, compounds might be put. Another advantage to this strategy is to identify or eliminate the risk of adverse effects. For example, right now, almost all new drugs have to be screened for effects on uh, QT interval prolongation on the electrocardiogram, which uh, can lead to sudden death. Uh, but if one recognizes that a drug does not in any way affect pathways that regulate the ion channels governing 
the QT interval, there may be no need to, uh, to uh, uh, spend the resources necessary to screen for QT prolongation. So this approach would enhance uh, repurposing of the existing uh, drug libraries, uh, but also uh, could be used to minimize drug development time in other ways by reducing the necessary screening for adverse effects that um, are required by most regulatory agencies. So I'll end with this slide uh, from a review that uh, Jane Leopold and I and Laura Lee and I put together and, and Jane Brad and I put together uh, that illustrates the relationship between network medicine and precision therapeutics. Here you can see on the left, uh, disease A with the heterogeneous population of individuals having that disease, the heterogeneity being a reflection of differences in, um, uh, in a disease expression, but also differences in the underlying uh, network uh, uh, infrastructure that governs the phenotype. So the goal here is to, is to combine deep phenotyping uh, with a network analysis and reticulotyping to allow one to segregate the subgroups of individuals into phenotypes that can be optimally treated with very specific therapies as driven by, guided by their reticulotypes. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank all of the folks with whom we've collaborated on the left and uh, individuals in our extended uh, research group with whom we've worked on the right. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, and now I think if there are any questions, you can type your questions in the chat. Or just ask questions maybe. Uh, I think we are not so familiar with typing our questions in the chat, apparently. You can just click on chat and type a message to uh, the group or to Paula or me. Well, I, I can just make a comment, Joe. That's fabulous as usual. Uh, uh, the uh, question I would ask is totally tangential, but how do we train the next generation in these very important ideas? What's your thinking on that? Because I know you've thought about it quite a bit. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for the question and the comment. Um, yeah, we, we, we have thought about it a, a lot and it's, it's challenging, of course, because on the one hand, the biology is complicated for the computationalists and the physicists and the mathematicians and the Physics and math uh, is often complicated or often complicated for the, for the general biologist. So we need to work together in teams and learn each other's language. Ed Silverman, um, who leads our network medicine division, um, and I have been working um, with our colleagues in Italy, uh, Sebastiano Folletti and Eugenio Gaudio on uh, putting together a certificate program in network medicine for the EU. And uh, we're working here with our, our dean, um, our dean for graduate programs, David Golan, to develop a master's program in network medicine as a way to begin to put a little more structure to uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the required education to, to get a little sense of this. But really, there's, you know, there's no substitute for the experience of trying to solve a problem. That, that's, that's certainly how you know, all of us learn best. But um, uh, it, it, one needs to be able to define the problem well enough to capture someone's interest at an early stage of their careers. Okay, thank you. Sure. Do we have other questions? I think we can also speak rather than using the chat if we... Oh yes, there is a question by John Wackenbush. Um, John, do you envision capturing changing PPI networks between individuals? How do we identify those changes in a, in a rapid fashion? I think this is a very good question. How can we do that quickly? Right, this, this is a challenging uh, question, John, but an important one because um, you know, we, uh, everything that I've presented here really doesn't uh, allow for the consideration of dynamic changes in network structure, strength of association, the consequences 
of post-translational modification and its effects on interactions, uh, let alone on uh, molecular pathways that govern a phenotype. So having a better sense of how to identify changes in uh, either the expression levels of a protein in the PPI or its uh, functional modulation by uh, post-translational modification is, is sort of the next, uh, the next tier of, uh, of analysis. I think it's gonna be challenging to explore all elements. So my, my strategy would be to identify the disease of interest and identify the key regulatory features of that disease module. So let's say you have a disease module that contains 500 proteins. And uh, as a result of your um, exploration of the determinants of dynamics in vitro, maybe only 30 of them really govern uh, significantly changes in the phenotype. Then you can put together a, a, a straightforward uh, transcriptomic screen for those limited number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, reg of highly regulated and regulating uh, features. That would be one approach. When you get to post-translational modification, aside from phosphorylation, things get much trickier because as you know, there are over 300 post-translational modifications that have been identified and you know, most of these are stochastic. They're not, uh, they're not necessarily enzymatically catalyzed. So that, uh, and they're not uh, in any way straightforward to ascertain uh, even by mass spectrometry. So that, uh, that, uh, that's another major challenge in the answer to your question. We have another question uh, by uh, Giuditta and Claudio. Uh, dear Joe, how about PPI network analysis and validation in tissues when viable? Right, so th th this is key. Uh, that, uh, if you really want to explore the individual reticular types, you have to have available tissue in the organ of interest, which is, I think, nicely exemplified by the, um, by the HCM study that I showed you from Andre and Brad. Uh, that um, <clears throat> on, if you don't have such tissue available or can't easily get it, let's say in the brain or even the liver, then one needs to sort out to what extent, if at all, circulating uh, biomarkers correlate uh, with network elements in the tissue. Um, and again, that would require simultaneously sampling the tissue of interest and peripheral blood. Um, now, obviously there are many genes which are not at all expressed in circulating blood cells that are expressed in uh, solid organs and vice versa. So it will limit um, the sensitivity of detecting uh, differentially expressed genes, but it may be uh, the only avenue um, in certain disease cases, but it, it's, a, it's a crucial level of analysis that has to be performed as well for all diseases. No other question. I think we still have one minute for one more question. If not, we are perfectly on time to give the floor to the second speaker, who is John Quackenbush. Uh, always from Regan Harvard, and the title of his talk is Why Bother with Networks? And we all strive to know why we should bother. So, John, please, you can take the floor. Uh, so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And as always, it's great to talk after Joe. Um, because he does such a wonderful job of setting the stage for the problems that we're trying to address. And in looking at networks, uh, I take uh, a somewhat different but complementary view to that that Joe presents. And um, it really comes down to understanding what the differences are between different network states and what drives them. So the human genome sequence that we have is about 20 years old. And when the genome was sequenced, we were presented with this picture that if we could identify all of the genes and maybe identify a handful of variants, <clears throat> we could actually understand a great deal of what drives human disease. But our fundamental application of the genome beyond looking for causative somatic mutations uh, or inherited mutations has really been to hypothesize that differences in patterns of gene expression are what distinguishes different disease states. And so a large part of the question that I and my colleagues have been asking now for almost 10 years <laughs> is what drives those differences in gene expression levels? What drives 
the differences between states. That looking at the DNA by itself doesn't give us the entire picture. Looking at RNA at least allows us to characterize different states. And as Joe pointed out, we want to try to understand how this affects the proteins, the structure, and the functions of cells. So we've been thinking about this question of examining what we refer to as gene regulatory networks, because these are the things that drive gene expression. And we want to be very precise by what we mean when we talk about gene regulatory networks. It's really this hypothesis that um, based on our understanding of the transcriptional process, that the differential expression we see between kidney and liver cells or between healthy and disease cells is really driven by the activation of a series of genes and their expression levels through the intervention of proteins in the genome that don't bind necessarily to each other, although they mind as part of the process, but fundamentally bind to the DNA itself and activate the transcriptional process. So we've been working on ways to try to model this and to refine these models. And Kimby Glass is gonna be talking about the way we've looked to expand this universe of models for quite some time um, and the different applications that we've developed around expanding these models. But the starting point for a lot of this is work that Kimby and I did together on uh, a method that we refer to as PANDA. And PANDA is based on our understanding that transcription factors bind the DNA. And we can form a hypothesis about which transcription factors bind in the neighborhood of which genes based on looking at motifs. Um, and that gives us an initial network. But sort of reflecting the question that I asked Joe, how does this network change between one individual and the next, even if they have the same disease? What we recognize is that those networks manifest themselves and are influenced by individual base differences. So we try to collect protein-protein interaction data between transcription factors because again, our understanding is that transcription factors can form complexes and those complexes are going to inform what we think of as our network model. But then also that if genes are co-expressed, they're likely regulated by the same transcription factors. So we define some functions on this network. We update the network given the data, and then we optimize the network over multiple iterations to arrive at a consensus. And we've applied this in a wide variety of different settings. And I'm not gonna talk about those um, in general, but one of the, the extensions of Panda that I at least wanna mention is an extension that we developed a number of years ago. And this is largely driven by Kimby and Marike Kujer and others uh, to look at individual sample networks. And the idea behind all of this is that if we have everyone attending this conference and we collected data from everyone and measured a network, but then left me out, the network that we would infer from the data with me and the data without me would differ subtly and so if I compare these two networks and look at the difference between them and scale them by the number of samples and then add this back to the network without me, you can convince yourself pretty quickly that what you end up with is an estimation of my individual network, all right? And this is just simple linear interpolation. I was talking to my son the other day about how we use this when I was in school to study things like, or to do things like estimate um, functions that were non-linear, but over small changes, small perturbations, those changes are linear. So we can estimate those functions, or we can estimate these networks. And then the question is, what can we do with these networks? And so we started to think a lot about looking at gene expression, which we know is often used to characterize phenotypes. Um, and we identify differentially expressed genes because those do provide us with some insight. But then we started to think about gene regulatory networks. And in fact, I should draw two here because each phenotype would be characterized by its own network. And as a starting point 10 years ago, we started looking at the structure of these networks, their topologies and differential expression. But increasingly we're looking at individual sample networks. And if I have an opportunity to talk next year, I'm gonna talk about work that John Plattig and Debbie Weghill and I have been doing on trying to tease and others have been doing uh, to try to tease out individual sample networks based on genotype. But what I wanna to do today is just give you a little overview of why we think this approach is so fundamentally important. 
And this is a, a review, a little sort of mini review that was just accepted for publication in Frontiers in Genetics. And in looking at this problem, what we decided that we wanted to do was to look at what gene expression tells us relative to what gene co-expression tells us relative to what we learn by looking at gene regulatory networks, the way we define them using this paradigm in Panda. So we started off with a toy model and we looked at four genes. We looked at 18 individuals, nine healthy individuals, nine individuals who we characterize as having some disease. And then we constructed a synthetic set of gene expression profiles for these four genes. And we constructed them in such a way that none of the genes are differentially expressed, but that patterns of uh, expression are shared between different genes. And so what this figure on the left indicates is our expression profiles in the upper uh, panel or at the A and B panels for the healthy individuals and the disease individuals, the middle panels simply show what we find if we take this toy model and look at differential expression, namely that none of these genes are significantly differentially expressed. But if we look at patterns of correlation, what we can find are sets of genes that are correlated in one individual and not correlated in another, in another individual. And what this really, or one group and not in another group, and what this really suggests to us is that you can look at patterns of disease association and start to think about the links between not individual genes, but sets of genes working together. And this harkens back to what Joe was talking about when he was talking about modules, only in this case, not necessarily modules that appear in protein-protein um, interaction networks, but modules that appear in gene expression data. And their techniques for looking at these types of differences like WGCNA, which are widely used. But again, what we've been thinking about is, is sort of going beyond just this kind of co-expression analysis. So co-expression is important because it is evidence for differential regulation of individual genes uh, or for co-regulation of individual genes. And underlying this panda model is, is this really simple idea that if I have two genes, call them G1 and G2 that are co-expressed, but I would predict that a certain transcription factor, say transcription factor number one, that this transcription factor regulates a set of genes or potentially regulates a set of genes that if two of those genes, G1 and G2, are co-expressed, I would say there's support for this hypothesis that transcription factor one regulates both of these genes. Right? So it's a very simple idea that gets at the heart of trying to go beyond just simple correlations in expression to understand what the drivers are. But the other key point goes back to the kind of analysis Joe was talking about, that these transcription factors form complexes. And that if we subset the, the complexes uh, or subset the networks that represent those complexes into different sets. And in our case, we're just gonna concentrate on the protein-protein interaction networks. That if I have two transcription factors that form a complex and one or more of them are associated with the expression of a gene, then my assumption is going to be that both of these work together to regulate an individual gene. And so this is really at the heart of this method in Panda, that what we want to try to do is take these patterns of differential expression that we see and use multiple lines of evidence to relate them back to understanding the ways in which these networks carry out the regulatory process or gene regulatory networks regulate genes. So why do this? Why bother? Well, as an example, and this appears in this Frontiers in Genetics paper, um, we started with data from TCGA on pancreatic cancer. We took the RNA-seq data that was available. We used Panda and Lioness together to estimate a collection of individual sample networks. And we looked at two subtypes of um, pancreatic cancer. One referred to as the basal subtype and the other referred to as the classical subtype. 
both of which are largely defined by differences in gene expression. So we got a collection of edge weights and we treat these as inferred measurements on the samples. So we have a collection of edge weights for the basal subtype, a collection for the classical subtype. And we use differential targeting analysis using LIMA to identify those edges, those associations between transcription factors and genes that we would predict would be different between different groups. And we simply ask if we compare this to differential expression or differential co-expression, can we gain meaningful insight into the nature of disease? So in doing this analysis, we took our top genes, we ranked them, and we did a simple go gene ontology enrichment analysis, looking at biological processes. What's really interesting about this is that differential expression shown here in blue identifies a set of processes um, some of which overlap with other methods, but some of which are distinct, right? We see genes that are differentially expressed and it's not surprising that we find these because these are the genes and these are the processes which are used to define the subtypes. So this is really giving us our definition. If we compare differential targeting analysis shown in uh, the reddish color and differential co-expression shown in, in the yellow color in the middle, what we see is they find a lot of the same basic processes being differentially regulated. And again, that's probably not surprising. But what was most interesting to me is that when we look at the top, just those things found by differential targeting analysis, what we see are a whole host of processes which are fundamentally important to understanding not only the nature of pancreatic cancer, but also the potential uh, drivers of response to different therapies and different perturbations. And this is something we've seen multiple times. We published a paper two years ago looking at differences between sex in males and females in colon cancer. And what we found was that the differential expression between different colon cancer cohorts was largely indistinguishable except for expression of X and Y genes. Right? What, what do you expect looking at differences between males and females? Now we didn't gain any insight into the underlying biology, but by looking at differential regulation, what we found was that we could predict differential response to chemotherapy in males and females, something that we know manifests itself clinically. What Debbie's doing right now is working with some colleagues at University of North Carolina to try to explore the differences we see in pancreatic cancer to see if we can actually use these to identify differences in therapy. We also recently had a paper accepted looking at uh, the same kind of analysis, looking at glioblastomas. Then what we find is the differential targeting of regulatory processes in glioblastoma is predictive of survival. And in fact, those regulatory processes are associated with immune response. Something that many people haven't looked at because of the blood brain barrier and the thought that immunotherapies or other therapies which um, target immune related processes may not be relevant in glioblastoma. But what this analysis shows us or what it suggests to us at least is that there are processes which may be responsive to immunotherapies in glioblastomas, a disease which is virtually a death sentence today. So this is really, uh, I think, an important reason why we've taken to under looking at to taken undertaken our looks at networks. In numerous applications, we found these networks provide insight into disease that we can't find using expression or co-expression by itself. Differential targeting also captures um, the phenotype's current expression, but we found is also important for predicting the potential for these different phenotypes to respond in different ways. And I think a big part of why this is so important is that in many cases, we get samples before we've used a therapy. And so what we wanna to try to understand is how those therapies change. And I would argue that changes in network structures can actually, actually help us to identify drivers of disease and identify therapeutic targets. So we've taken this approach seriously. Marrow and Ben Gabilla and others in my group um, have worked together to capture and collect all of the gene regulatory networks that we've 
uh, managed to infer over the last 10 years or so and infer a whole host of others. And they're captured in a database that we call GRAND, the Gene Regulatory Network Database. Um, what we've done with GRAND is we've actually taken this hypothesis that differences in regulatory patterns can be associated with differences in therapy. And we've used it to analyze a number of different diseases and disease states. So we have a paper that we're about to submit uh, describing this analysis. I believe a preprint is already up on BioArchive. And what we do with this analysis is we take the data from um, the connectivity map and clue, looking at cell lines and perturbations of their expression that occur, and we infer gene regulatory networks. And now we take this hypothesis that differences in networks lead to differences in regulation. And rather than just looking at changes in gene expression, we ask what genes alter network structure and can we predict the ways in which network structure can be appropriately altered by particular drugs in a way that will help us identify therapeutic targets. And what we have is a whole set of different gene regulatory changes in networks that we found that are linked to individual drugs in ways that are predictive of their efficacy. So we did an analysis of colon cancer and we identified an experimental compound, MK5108, that represents a potential therapy for colon cancer as an adjuvant to chemotherapy. And in looking at the literature, what we discovered is that this is in fact an Aurora kinase inhibitor and it's in clinical trials now in non-small cell lung carcinoma. So we didn't know this before we started, but clearly what these networks are doing is giving us leads to identify new drugs and new compounds that may ultimately be efficacious in the clinic. And we have other applications and other diseases, um, all of which really harken back to the simple idea that gene expression is driven by regulatory networks. And if we can identify those networks, we can make progress in understanding and treating disease. All of the methods we've developed are freely available. We've collected all of these into a, a package we call the Network Zoo, um, and you can download and run them. They're available in R, Python, C, um, and MATLAB. And with that, I just wanna thank the really talented group of colleagues and collaborators I've worked with over the years to help develop these ideas. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, John, for that really exciting talk. Um, we have time for one or two questions. Maybe I could begin by asking you, um, in, in, with regard to uh, co-expression and to, um, uh, if one dissects the tissue, the transcription factor regulation of co-expressed genes, do you, are there instances in which there's sort of a, a hierarchical uh, layer that uh, in turn influences the co-expression of different tissue factors, uh, sorry, different transcription factors? Uh, is there is sort of a, you know, pyramidal hierarchy with respect to uh, transcription factor expression that can account for differential protein expression, especially in cases where the proteins don't seem to bear any functional relationship to each other? So, uh, you know, there's sort of two or three questions buried in that. And I think Kimby's going to talk a little bit about some of the analysis that we've done looking at um, differential regulation in different tissues and in different states. One of the interesting things we find is that the transcription factors that are active in differentiating states sit in sort of this interesting place in the overall gene regulatory networks. They're often not at the core of the network. And what we think of in looking at the, the core, the center of that network, is that these are processes which are absolutely essential for survival. They're not at the periphery where they have very little effect. They're in somewhat an intermediate place. And they sit in that intermediate place because they can affect substantial changes in the structure of the network by making a small number of changes in their connections. So we have another method for inferring community structure in bipartite networks, and it's called alpaca. And what we see in applying alpaca to <laughs> gene regulatory network models is that some of these small changes in transcription factor connectivity 
actually lead to changes in functional modules that occur in these gene regulatory networks. So the transcription factors themselves work together and individually to create functional groups. What we rarely find is that they aggregate together um, disparate functions. They tend to activate genes that have common functions and they tend to form communities that regulate those common functions. But when I say common, I'm, I'm defining this in kind of a broad way. So um, they're often disease related, although they may uh, affect the multifactorial process of disease. Great. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Well, I think we should move on. There, there is a, another question for you, but uh, Faishan, we, we can hold that for the uh, end of the session when we'll have a little more time for broader discussion. So thanks, John. All right, well, thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the talk. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, uh, our co-chair for this session, Paola Velardi. Paola is from the University of Rome Sapienza and uh, she is a computer scientist who will talk about ontological and connectivity structure of disease gene modules yeah, that human interact. i too, that you're up there for so long that we wouldn't be able to get out. Right, and I can't jump up and get you today. And so I was sitting here thinking, what is he gonna get here? What is he gonna get here? All right, what? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you, can you see my screen? Joseph, can you all see my screen? Yes, yes everything's okay. fine. Thank you. Very good. So um, this is joint work with Lorenzo and Giorgio from Sapienza University of Rome. Um, wait a second, that my slides are not advancing. Ah. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, one, these are the motivational objectives of this work. Um, we are focusing on the use of ontologies. Ontologies, human curated disease ontologies are widely used for a variety of purposes, for example, for diagnostic evaluation and decision support. Um, however, like the classification principles that underlie these ontologies uh, are um, often based on anatomical and histological principle as, as the main um, guiding uh, principle. Um, more recently, uh, some on, um, the ontology, like for example, the disease ontology is also integrating some, some etiological and genetic origin of diseases, but basically nosology, so the science of taxonomy still reflects a, a reductionist uh, uh, perspective. So um, the purpose of our study is to shed more light on disease similarity by comparing um, the um, structural proximity, so the physical proximity of disease modules in the human interactome with the um, categorical proximity in human curated ontologies. Now, the notion of disease modules has been already um, uh, presented and all of the audience know very well what they are. Uh, in particular, we are interested in the um, uh, shared component hypothesis. So the hypothesis that if two disease modules are close or overlap, then the pathobiological similarity of the corresponding diseases uh, are also expected to be, to be strong. So, um, uh, do the, 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 uh, these two notions of similarity, one based on um, human understanding of, of the, of the, um, of the disease and the other based on, uh, uh, on the disease module hypothesis, do they tell us a different story? So uh, our objective here is to um, identify and analyze correspondences between the existing human classification of diseases and that that can be induced from the structure of the interactome. Now here, um, we have a sort of workflow of our study. 
Um, we start with a human interactome and we map disease modules onto the interactome. And then we try to induce a full-fledged taxonomy uh, by exploiting the, uh, the disease module hypothesis. Uh, next, uh, we um, try to um, we select a, a disease ontology, uh, which we call the reference ontology. So RT stands for reference ontology and IT for induced ontology. Um, and our purpose is to create a mapping between those two that, as we will see, is not something which is completely straightforward. Uh, once we make those two taxonomies comparable, then there are a number of possible findings, like, for example, identifying promising networks are in the interactome where new disease gene can be predicted, or also finding unexpected uh, disease molecular relationship that can be used to enrich uh, a human defined uh, taxonomy. And also, um, we could identify some, some unexpected but not realistic um, proximity relation that lead us to identify some nomenclature error in publicly available disease gene association database. Um, now, the first step of this, this procedure is to induce uh, a taxonomy from, from the human interactome. Uh, now, in fact, we use two definition. Two, as you know, the definition of disease module is not strictly um, similar to the network uh, definition of network science definition of what a module is. So we use two uh, definition to identify modules, which are commonly used in literature, like induced module and largest connected component. Uh, we also um, tried with two distance measure between disease modules, which is based on previous literature. And finally, we um, applied hierarchical agglomerative clustering to uh, create, to induce a taxonomy. Uh, again, we are using a couple of different hyperparameters to create this taxonomy. And so in the end, we obtain not one, but several uh, possible uh, taxonomy, and uh, uh, we define a methodology, which I don't have time to describe here, to select the one which is most promising. Now, um, the second step is to compare this, this, this taxonomy with, with one reference taxonomy. We uh, selected for several reasons the disease ontology as being the reference taxonomy, but in principle, those two are very different. Uh, they have a different structure, they have a different depth because um, hierarchically induced taxonomies are binary ones, so they have much more depth. Uh, and also the, 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 um, uh, the placing of, of the uh, leaf intermediate node are, is very different. So there is a process that is needed in order to make those two um, actually comparable. Uh, now, I don't want to go through this process here. Perhaps the, the, um, most of the audience are not computer scientists. But in the end, uh, what we obtain are uh, two taxonomies that can be compared after a process which is composed of several steps, merging nodes, splitting nodes, removing nodes, which are uh, not present in one of the two ontologies. Once we have done that and still preserving the taxonomic relationship between, between the two um, taxonomies, uh, we start with, other, with our uh, analytic word. Um, so the, 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 the last interesting step is uh, the semantic labeling because um, our induced taxonomy um, does not have names on the intermediate node. So the leaf node are the disease modules, but the uh, non-leaf node do not have names. Now to allow a comparison, what we would like to do is to attach a label to those nodes based on our reference taxonomy. Um, now, given a, a whatever node, for example, consider this node here, a possible definition of this node is the cluster of the disease modules that can be reached by this node. Uh, 
And a similar definition we can have also for the reference taxonomy. Now, based on that, we can identify nodes in the uh, induced taxonomy with a high overlap uh, of the respective clusters with a, uh, um, uh, with a disease ontology, with our reference ontology. And we can select uh, to label only those nodes for which a high, um, we define the similarity uh, between clusters as the Jacquard similarity, a high similarity exists. So we cannot achieve a total labeling of the induced taxonomy, but a partial labeling. Now, um, uh, at this point, um, we can analyze these this, this results and we have a, a, a number of, of research questions. First is if we can identify categories uh, in the reference taxonomy, which correspond to dense neighborhoods of the uh, disease interactome. So um, uh, um, sub trees of the two taxonomy with a very high, uh, interaction that possibly in these areas we can detect new relationship. Um, another more interesting issue is can we find unexpected and unexplored neighborhood in the induced taxonomy? Um, so relationship, similarity relationship which are not present in human curated taxonomy but could be used to enrich those, those taxonomies. And uh, um, the third issue is whether we can find some unconvincing strong matches between those two, uh, which may be originated by, by, by some, some error in um, uh, publicly available database. Now here is just to visualize some of the results. Um, here you can see um, uh, um, uh, an area where the, 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 the two um, taxonomies have a very high overlapping, both uh, as for uh, the number of uh, um, disease modules and also for the structure is very similar. These are the disease of cellular proliferation. This is not a new result, but it is in a sense a confirmatory result. Um, another thing is to um, uh, the, the, the yellow uh, areas that you see here are um, diseases, uh, disease categories which correspond to anatomical classification principles. So we try to pairwise um, uh, uh, compare those, those uh, areas to see if there is any kind of, of interaction between um, diseases of um, belonging to different anatomical subsystem. And as you can see here, um, those areas are very scattered over uh, the interactome. So actually our study did not, does not disconfirm the validity of the anatomical classification principle, although we cannot tell whether this is due to the high incompleteness of the uh, knowledge on disease modules and the interactome, or if actually those interactions do not exist. Um, a more inter interesting findings is that we um, could identify some pairs of um, diseases um, who are very close in the interactome that, but are not related in, in the taxonomy. Um, those, we have several of those, but for some of that, we could find some, some so of course we, we don't have any chance in our group to test clinically the validity of this hypothesis, uh, hypothesis but we could find the literature very recent uh, results of the last year of papers mentioning this, this type of relationship. So uh, this is just to, confirm that, that this um, uh, method could help identifying unknown relation that could be used to uh, enrich uh, human taxonomies. Um, lastly, um, uh, as, a, uh, as a third result, we also inspected um, some um, uh, um, very close uh, disease modules, which 
somehow did not convince our medical expert. And by looking in detail, uh, we found that these, these association were derived by uh, errors in, uh, in order to map disease modules in the two taxonomies, we use a very popular disease association database, which is this genet. Uh, and uh, this analysis allows us to identify errors, nomenclature errors in, in this database. A number of those are, are cited in, in the preprint of, of this paper. So uh, all in all, to conclude, um, the, 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 the methodology that I presented today has supported some clinical relevant findings such as um, areas in which um, uh, uh, promising areas in the tractome to discover new disease disassociation, but also unexplored molecular relationship that could be used to enrich um, current ontology and also nomenclature errors, which are also a useful finding because, because scientists use a lot those, those databases. So being able to identify some errors has some, some value. Finally, there is, I have to mention, one limitation of this study, uh, which is, uh, um, again, due to the highly incomplete knowledge of disease-related uh, genes. Um, we could map only 12% of disease uh, ontology diseases onto uh, disease modules of the interactome. We have to mention that we only consider those disease modules of um, which included at least 10 proteins, uh, because uh, otherwise it would be impossible to identify any, any structure in this. Um, and for, the, for, for this reason, uh, in some cases, it is impossible to, to, um, to have a clear interpretation of unobserved molecular relationship, um, which could be either motivated by by the non-existence of such relation or by the lack of, of, uh, um, of knowledge uh, on gene interaction in specific areas of the interactome. And this particularly applies to uh, diseases of anatomical classification uh, principle. Um, okay, um, this is all, and this is a number of papers that we are on which we built our result. Plus, there is a, the pre, uh, sort of preprint of, of the paper um, of the study that I described today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paula. So we have time for a couple of questions. I guess I, I was surprised at the overall percentage um, of, uh, of prediction, if you will, of the, uh, the uh, standard taxonomy by the, uh, by the uh, uh, induced taxonomy. And uh, I, in some cases, it makes perfectly good sense, such as in neoplastic diseases, where we understand the mechanisms much more deeply, and there's much more literature from which one could pool a greater number of proteins or genes. In others, um, you know, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is um, probably a variety of different diseases, uh, it's more of an inclusive kind of diagnosis, much like heart failure. Uh, it would seem that uh, that there'd be a, a, a much a far uh, uh, more limited likelihood that the two would would correlate as well as as, as the average. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, uh, the, the, in fact, what we um, what we did is to ask our uh, medical expert to observe those associations that we found, and based on that, they did some 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 research on published paper. So we don't have, um, as I said, uh, whenever we found those unexpected, as you are mentioning, unexpected association, um, we either. Um, we found very recent literature mentioning the possibility of, of such uh, connections as for the three cases which I was showing in my slide. So the, there are papers published that, that do um, uh, that mention this, this 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 similarity, these associations. 
In other cases, we couldn't find anything. Uh, in other cases, by going in detail, we found that those were due to uh, mismatches in the, in the um, um, disease names on the, this genet. So it is a variety of possible interpretation of these results, but some of those seems to be plausible, although unexpected. Great, thank you. And Fei Xiang asks, uh, he says there are different uh, types of disease similarities, such as disease comorbidities and resilience. Do you have any suggestion as to how we can distinguish disease comorbidities and resilience mechanisms um, during or as a result of disease similarity analysis using network approaches? No, I'm sorry, I, I don't because I am not a doctor. So perhaps my co-author doctor would answer this, this question if he is here. Giorgio? No, so I'm sorry, and I'm okay. not able to answer your, your, your question. Thank you. Well, great, thank, thank you very much. So we'll, I think we'll go to the next speaker, Paula. And okay, so the, uh, the last but not speaker before the, um, the coffee break is Kimberly Glass, always from Brigham Harvard. And uh, the title of her talk is Cells, Tissues and Regulatory Networks. So please, Kimberly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paula. It's uh, you know, a blessing and a curse to be at the end of the session because I know everyone's probably you know ready to get up and stretch their legs. But it's also great because I had such a good introduction to everything I'm about to talk about. Uh, so as Paula said today, I'm going to talk about cells, tissues, and regulatory networks. And I always like to start with a bit of motivation. Why are we doing this, and why should we even study gene regulatory networks? Well, the main reason I'm interested in studying gene regulatory networks is because of this notion of biological processes. We know that things that happen during disease, during health, as we, we grow and change and develop, are not due to single genes or single proteins acting in isolation, but by connections and how those um, elements talk to each other in the cell. One way to through what's known as a gene regulatory network, and this is a pretty simplistic model of the, the very complex process, but in this network nodes are genes and edges are connections between genes. Now those edges have a very specific interpretation. They go from transcription factors to targets to represent causality. Finally, the last reason I think it's important to study gene identify changes in process parent network and health versus disease and you identify processes that are different between the two, you could be able to develop targeted therapies. Now, how do we build gene regulatory networks? Well, it's complicated. So here's a crash course in molecular biology. On the slide, I have a black line. Along the DNA sequence are locations, um, what are known as sequence motifs, where transcription factors can come and bind to the DNA. Now, transcription factors, as Joe mentioned, as Paula mentioned, as John mentions, everyone mentioned, don't act in isolation. They actually form protein complexes, and you can measure these through protein-protein interactions. Now, along the DNA, um, it's not just naked ACGT. There are genetic variants, SNPs, things that have been changed. There's CG methylation, epigenetic modifications that don't impact the, the DNA sequence. There's also 3D epigenetic structure, things like um, chromatin structure, chromatin state, um, um, histones, nucleosomes. And the end of this whole process is something we like to think about as the expression of a gene. Well, what is the expression of a gene? It's an mRNA that's expressed that then can have microRNAs come and bind to it, which then eventually gets translated into proteins. So that was a huge cross course in molecular biology. What do we do with this? Well, we want to build a network. So this is a really daunting task. One way we, we have started to tackle this is through a method that John introduced you to earlier, which is Panda. And very briefly, let me run through quickly how Panda takes this complex process and puts it into a mathematical framework. To begin with, with Panda, we think about that downstream target gene slash protein as an element on the DNA that can be targeted by an upstream transcription factor. So we can map transcription factors to genes. We do this for all transcription factors for which we have information about how they might bind to the DNA. We can also develop maps between pairs of transcription factors based on how we know they may form protein complexes. We know something about the output of the genes, namely their mRNA level, 
we use this to understand how those genes are co-expressed. Now, these three sources of data form our three sources of input information for the PANDA model. Specifically, we have protein-protein interactions, transcription factor gene interactions, and gene-gene co-expression information. This is drawn through the message passing framework John described earlier, and we get one gene regulatory network. Now we have used the PANDA approach in many different applications, and with 15 minutes, there's not nearly enough time to go through um, <laughs> all of these. Um, but I was going to focus on one specific one today um, because it's one in which we explored um, how regulation changes in different tissues. Now in this particular application, we applied PANDA to study tissue specific regulation using GTEx expression data. And for those of you who are not familiar with GTEx expression data, it's an expression data set where they measured uh, roughly 50 different um, uh, tissues and almost 10 um, thousand samples um, across 550 individuals. We reduced this down to 38 different tissues um, based on various um, pre-processing, you know, cleaned up our individuals um, based on sex annotations, etc. Tissue built a work with the same PPI and regulatory network and built 38 different tissues. So how can we use this to understand tissue specific regulation? Well, I apologize, but there's a little bit of math on my slides because I think it helps understand things, but I'll also walk through um, what is going on here. And in particular, in our 38 different tissue networks, we have an estimate, estimation of how strongly a transcription factor regulates a gene in every single tissue in all 38 tissues. What we can do is we comp can compare the weight of that edge from a transcription factor to gene in a given tissue, compare it to its weight across all 38 tissues and divide by essentially the, the interquartile range or a standard score. This gives us an estimate of how specific that edge is to that given tissue, meaning is it much higher weighted in one tissue compared to all the rest. What we can do is we can do this for every single edge and every single tissue, and we define an edge score in a given tissue as a tissue specific if the score is greater than n. Well, we varied the cutoff for n and we ended up choosing a score of two. And this is the distribution of the number of edge that are called specific in no tissues, one tissue, two tissues, three tissues, et cetera, using this calculation. So this tells us something about the specificity of edges. Most edges don't appear as tissue specific at all. And about a quarter seem to be specific to one or more tissues. Now I've taken the same bar chart and put it on its side. And the question becomes, where do these edges appear? Are they mostly in one tissue or are they evenly spread out across all tissues? Well, it turns out the vast majority of edges that are specific to a particular tissue is in the testes. Um, it is actually dominant, a very, very large number of tissue specific edges. This may not be surprising um, given things we know about um, testes in particular. For all the other tissues, the distribution looks fairly similar um, with um, some tissues having more tissue specific edges and some having fewer. Now the question becomes, this is for network edges. What about the nodes? Why not just do things based on gene expression? So what we did is we used the expression levels of genes to quantify gene multiplicity using the exact same approach as we used for the edges. And over here shows the distribution, the same tissues for gene multiplicity. Is that gene more highly expressed in one tissue compared to the others and two tissues compared to the others, et cetera? What we see is that network edges are more likely to be identified as specific to only a single tissue. There's more of this dark blue color over here. In Interesting, now the subset of genes that encode transcription factors, which is what we're really interested in gene regulation, we find that the pattern is even more striking. Transcription factors are even more likely to be identified as specific in multiple different tissues compared to genes. And also there, there's a smaller percentage of transcription factors that are identified as tissue specific compared to genes. I don't have the background numbers here, but in our network, we have roughly 30,000 genes that we analyze. You see about a third of them are identified as tissue specific. We also analyze about 650 to 700 transcription factors. So less than a third. So you can just kind of already eyeball this. So what does this mean as far as tissue specificity? Well, it means tissue specific regulation is more than just transcription factor expression and even more than just gene expression. There's the connections between these elements. So how can we quantify this? We quantify this um, by running gene set enrich analysis. And the figure on the left is kind of the summary of our results. So let me walk you through how we created that. 
what we did is we took the GSEA tool um, from the Broad Institute and we have a profile of how much each transcription factor targets all genes in each tissue. We ran gene set enrichment analysis on each of those profiles, so 38 tissues and 652 transcription factors. That was 24,000 different GSE analyses. That's what forms the different columns of this matrix. We then selected um, GoTerm TF um, um, tissue pairs that are significant. Basically, when you did the CA association that had an FDR less than 0 0.001, and we clustered the results. And the results clustered in the 62 different communities, but in particular, there were nine communities that really stood out as dominant. Community one, two, three, four, and five. Well, we see that their collections of gene ontology terms or biological processes, they're enriched in collections of tissues and transcription factors. So let's take, for example, this first um, community, community one. It's enriched for 75 different gene ontology terms. The top category is immune response, but if we do a word cloud of all the gene ontology terms inside that community, we see a collection of related processes. We can do this for all nine different communities, and we can further map those communities to which tissue they're known to be enriched in. In other words, this set of transcription factor tissue pairs over here is the exact same set as, as over here. And what we can see is that this community one has a high number of transcription factors associated with tissue specific regulation in the arteries, the aorta artery, the coronary artery, and the tibial artery. And there's a lot of good information in this plot. But the other good example I like to point out, because I think it's fun, is this particular community here, which is community four, where you see terms such as muscle contraction, cell remodeling, et cetera. And we can see that that has enrichment for transcription factor targeting in the atrial appendage, the kidney, and skeletal muscle, which makes a lot of sense. In other words, we're identifying transcription factors having tissue-specific processes. So that tells us something about tissue-specific gene regulation, but I want to spend some time really talking about how we've used some of our other approaches to understand regulation um, in tissues. And in particular, John mentioned this approach called Linus um, that I had developed together with Marika Kujer. And one thing Linus is able to do is instead of building one network for a set of samples, it builds one network for each individual input sample. In other words, instead of having a single brain network, we might have a network for every single person that has donated brain tissue. So how does Linus work? Well, with Panda, we just generate one network given a bunch of input samples. For Linus, we recognize the fact that if we generate a network with all samples and all samples minus one, there's going to be subtle changes in there. And we've done a mathematical derivation. Um, it's all incomplete in the supplement of the paper. We can show that given um, a few assumptions about how these networks are put together, we can actually reverse engineer the network for each individual input sample by comparing these two, what I, we call aggregate networks, one with all samples and one with all samples minus one. And that gives us one individual sample for each of the input, um, uh, eight, one network for each of the input samples. Similar to Panda, we've applied Linus in a whole host of, of different places, um, some of which John touched on earlier. But I was going to dig into this um, paper here, Sex Differences in Gene Expression and Regulatory Networks Across 29 Human Tissues. Now, one thing that uh, we applied it to the same um, gene expression data, GTEx gene expression data, um, and we characterize differential expression, differential targeting. One advantage that the Linus networks have is they allow us to really do systematic differential targeting analysis. So for example, normally when we do differential expression analysis, we don't you know, just compare the mean expression of a gene in subtype A to subtype B, we compare it by modeling covariates. Do the people with certain subtypes tend to be younger, tend to have a, a higher BMI, tend to be more male or female, et cetera. And so what we did in this particular ap application is we were able to quantify differential expression using a linear model, a lemma approach. We were able to model covariates that were important for sexual dimorphism, things like age, BMI, race, etc. We did the exact same thing um, using our output networks. In this case, we have an edge between transcription factors and genes in every single sample. We have different samples, and what we can do is we can quantify differential targeting looking at the weight of edges across all female samples versus the weight of edges across the male samples. And so as a proof of concept, um, I'm going to explore one edge in detail to kind of give you a, a sense of how this works. 
This is an edge from ESR1 to CST3 in the heart. Remember, we did this in 29 different tissues, many, many different transcripts and factors, many genes. This is just one example edge. Here's the differential expression of CST3. We can see it's slightly higher expressed in males compared to females, and this is actually highly statistically significant. This is now the distribution of the edge weight between ESR1 and CST3 in the heart. We see that it is also more highly weighted in males compared to females. And we can kind of unfurl these two sets of information, and that's what's plotted in this top plot here. This is the actual expression of CST3 across all the different samples in the GTEx database, all the heart samples, excuse me. And this is the edge weight of ESR1 point to, pointing to CST3 in those samples. We see that there's a high level of correlation. This down here is a, a control to show that we wouldn't have gotten this if we'd simply looked at the correlation and the expression levels between these two genes. In other words, ESR1 isn't necessarily differentially expressed, but it is differentially regulating CST3, and that regulation is impacting CST3's expression. We can quantify this differential expression based on a t-statistic, and this plot here on the right tells us the differential expression of all the putative targets of ESR1, as well as the differential targeting value of ESR1. In our example, ST3 is highlighted, and we can see that it has a high level of differential expression, which more highly expressed in males compared to females, and a higher level of differential targeting. We did this, and I want you to focus on this correlation value here. We have done this for all 29 tissues and all um, transcription factors. And our example right here, ESR1 in heart, you can see it has a really high expression targeting correlation. But we can see that ESR1 is not always the highest one. In fact, there are other transcription factors that seem to be important for mediating sexual dimorphism across different tissues. What we did is we took a, a cutoff and we did essentially the same thing we did in our previous analysis. We ran gene set matching analysis on all differential targeting patterns um, in all different tissues um, to explore if transcription factors were targeting in a sex-specific manner. And this is just one example, um, again, from heart. Um, these are the different transcription factors we tested, and these are the enriched uh, gene ontology terms and keg pathways from our analysis. And we can see that we find many um, important tissue-specific pro processes that are targeted in a sex-specific manner. So that's the, the main thing I want to talk about today. I want to spend one minute just kind of wrapping up and kind of give back to this big picture overview. I spent a lot of time digging into some specific analyses. In particular, what about the other omics? I started with this big picture, and those of you who are paying close attention notice that I only use three main sources of data, protein-protein interactions, transcription factor DNA interactions, and mRNA expression. What about everything else? Well, I've been working on developing methods, particularly for microRNAs and epigenetic data. And without going into too many details, I've been working on developing a method with Marika Kudra that just came out last year in bioinformatics that allows us to model microRNA regulation of genes. We've actually applied Puma to study this exact same GTEx RNA-seq data, and that allowed us to identify microRNAs that are regulating tissue-specific processes that also have evidence for perturbing um, diseases in the same tissue. We've also been developing a method called SPIDER, where we use SPIDER to filter input data, use epigenetic data, um, to basically seed the Panda algorithm. And we've tested SPIDER using different... SPIDER protects act and cell type specific networks, you know, kind of universally given the input data. Okay, so to wrap up and in conclusion, I hope now, um, you know, this is the audience that all believes this, but networks are a powerful way to model biological processes. In particular, gene regulatory networks are a way to model biological processes. Analyzing these networks can lead to very important insights into biological systems. I highlighted tissues. Really, you know, Panda and Linus, you know, gene expression isn't the end of the story. There's many other types of omics data out there. Developing regulatory network models that can effectively integrate multiple types of omics data is really critical. And with that, I'll throw up my acknowledgement slide and take any questions. Great. Thank you, uh, King. So we have time for uh, one question or so. Uh, 
And if I could ask everyone uh, uh, with future presentations, please turn off your videos unless you're the obviously the presenter, because we were getting some uh, some uh, uh, abrupt interruptions as you I think everybody heard with uh, Kimberly's presentation. So any uh, questions? Um, hi, my name is Lalit. Um, I'm actually from not from bioinformatics or network modeling, but I come from the other side, where is organ imaging. Like mm -hmm. we really look at uptakes, glucose uptakes, and other kind of information in organs. So what you actually showed us is pretty interesting. Like we we had no clue there are like so many interactions that are already going on, and you had a nice way to uh, show how these tissues actually interact. But my question is, how do you look at it on a macro level in the sense that we are looking at in a, in a, in a sense of um, positron emission tomography in the sense that we look at glucose uptake of different organs, like how organs do metabolism. So, and right now we have this particular device that where we could see the, the way the cells or these tissues eat glucose over mm -hmm. the time. And how would you translate this particular concept to, to our domain in the sense like, instead of looking at just on gene expression, how would you look, uh, look, look at it with a different parameter, like, like metabolism, for example? Yeah, metabolism in particular is a, a tricky um, type of data that we, I've spent a little bit of time thinking about, but, but not, not a ton. Um, so I, I think with the idea of metabolism is you need to understand the relationships between proteins and metabolites and how those change on a very tissue specific level. And one thing you could imagine doing is taking something like the Panda framework where you have some sort of initial guess of how proteins and metabolites interact, um, say based on known databases. And then you have information about specific metabolic levels inside a given tissue. In that case, you could build a network from proteins to metabolites that is tissue specific, similar to how we built a network from proteins to genes, and kind of do a similar analysis to see is how proteins are acting metabolites changing in a tissue specific manner, and what are those connections, and do they highlight something relevant um, for, for disease, for particular processes in that tissue, et cetera. But for doing so, you need to have some kind of a priori knowledge. That's what you're, that, um, you need, you're pushing towards, right? I generally push towards a prior knowledge because I think that a lot of times there are a lot of databases out there that are imperfect but have some of this mapped out. If you don't have good mapping based on a prior knowledge, you could imagine building an initial set of connections between proteins and metabolites just based on, again, expression information. If you have mRNA expression, and metabolomic expression, but then you get farther and farther away from the underlying mechanism, which I think is what actually makes regulatory networks really powerful, is it's trying to test a really specific mechanism um, and say, we know how these things are supposed to interact. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, well, thanks very much, Kim. Okay, so let's uh, return uh, to the agenda. Our next speaker is Dean Jones from Emory, and Dean will be speaking about biochemical networks and redox biology. Thanks, Dean. Well, thanks, Joe. Um, I want to start off by saying I have no financial conflicts uh, to disclose and to acknowledge the uh, generous financial support from multiple uh, national institutes of health. Um, <clears throat> to start with, redox networks are important uh, because oxidative stress occurs with most human disease. What we understand now is that much of this relates to the widespread role of hydrogen peroxide in cell signaling. And uh, Helmut Cease and I reviewed this last year, so I won't go into any detail on this, but it's, it's very widespread in multiple uh, systems that really regulate uh, uh, cell function. So one of the essential concepts uh, for redox networks, which is really an important departure from 20th century dogma, is that there are kinetic limitations in thiol disulfide systems. And the reason this is so critical is that the cysteines in proteins are the major reversible redox component in macromolecular systems. And the first evidence for the uh, lack of, uh, for the kinetic control was actually this paper in 2000. 
I won't go into, but this led us into uh, thinking about the concept of networks and uh, the uh, uh, important work, uh, uh, one of uh, Laszlo Barabasi's early papers uh, was what led me to start thinking about this. And what we recognized was that a bilateral hierarchical scale-free network with known redox hubs is sufficient to maintain really individualized control of the redox states of all 214,000 cysteines encoded in the human genome. And so what this gives us a, is a way to think about the, a, uh, an organization structure of the redox proteome. So to quickly summarize, uh, 10 to 20% of the 214,000 cysteines are redox active. Um, these function in controlling protein structure, protein distribution, and protein activities. Uh, now, what is important also to recognize is that we are limited in our analytic methods for redox proteomics, um, or we have been, and uh, the, the, the consequence is that because the proteins vary in concentration by nine orders of magnitude, and the reactivities of the cysteines vary by seven orders of magnitude, uh, we have a, a really a major problem in trying to get the precise uh, circuitry of the uh, redox proteome. But the reason this is so important in terms, in my mind, is, uh, is really this finding with Arshed Kiyami's group we published now a few years ago, that uh, plasma, human plasma redox measures are predictors of death as an outcome. And I, uh, I won't go into that in detail, but that's really a motivating factor for, for looking at this. So, Many years ago, we started looking at integrated omics as, a, as an opportunity for uh, a biochemistry group to uh, move things forward in terms of uh, redox systems biology. And so uh, one of the types of studies that we've done is to do uh, correlation arrays and uh, see what the top correlations are. And so this was a study that we did with uh, uh, calcium or with cadmium uh, exposures in mice. And what we found was that uh, the top uh, most uh, uh, central hub in terms of the, uh, the correlations um, was uh, one that consisted of, I think, 28 different cysteines in enzymes and transporters of fatty acid metabolism. And these were correlated with acyl carnitines and acyl CoA's. Uh, that are uh, known substrates and products of those uh, enzymes and transport systems. And then there was a secondary hub of enzymes and transporters of branch chain amino acids. And what was very reassuring was that this hub was connected to me intermediary metabolites that were branch chain fatty acids, which of course are also metabolized by the uh, beta oxidation pathway. So uh, the, the beauty of the uh, model systems for this type of research is that it can be validated. So uh, whereas there's always the criticism that uh, you get snapshots, only snapshots, if you uh, uh, measure the transcriptome or the metabolome or the redox proteome. The reality is in a model system, you can validate it because you can measure flux. And so we did that in this study um, showing that this works. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work on this now, uh, you know, good descriptors of the uh, thiol redox networks with the oxidative hubs and the reductive hubs and how these are connected to control the specific cysteines and different uh, redox networks within the cell. Um, and I wanted to just emphasize that the earlier limitations for redox proteomics appear to have uh, recently been overcome with Chinese new methods uh, because this now gives us the ability to measure uh, tens of thousands of uh, the cysteine protein or the proteins, uh, cysteines. I want to turn now to talk about the redox code. Um, the redox code uh, was really developed by Helmut Cease and I uh, as a 
consequence of, uh, of this observation, that while the genetic code provides logic for information storage in transmission, and central dogma provides logic for the use of information to direct protein synthesis, we really don't have logic for the other characteristics of life. And so um, for this, we, uh, we introduced the redox code and I'll, uh, it, this will become clearer as the, uh, in a couple of slides as far as the motivation on this. Um, but the purpose of this was really to understand, to, to help understand the guiding organizational principles for aerobic organisms. And I think this is important because these can be useful to help understand redox networks. Um, now the first of the, the first principle is that bioenergetic systems operate at near equilibrium through NADH and NADPH systems. Uh, now, this was already recognized a half a century ago that the um, NADH system here on the bottom where the uh, redox potentials for the steady state redox potentials are given, uh, these are functioning in catabolism, uh, whereas uh, cells need to be able to also conduct anabolism and defense mechanisms simultaneously with catabolic processes. And so uh, what was recognized was that the anabolic and defense functions are maintained by a different redox hub, and that is the NADPH, NADP system. And so both of these systems are um, in near equilibrium reactions with the precursors and products here shown on the right. The second uh, principle of the uh, redox code is that these bioenergetic and metabolic regulation systems are linked to macromolecular structure and function through protein switches. And so the redox switches was, was where we started on this, but in fact, now as we understand it, is that the, uh, the near equilibrium conditions uh, that govern the NADPH and NADH systems are really interconvertible with transmembranal uh, transmembrane potentials, the chemoosmotic gradients, and the uh, high energy currencies like ATP and ADP. So these are actually controlling factors through the second principle, which is that these redox linked switches control the macromolecular structure distribution and activities. And I think what, what has been missed in the way we've been thinking about metabolomics is that if we uh, accept this second principle, then redox theory predicts there should be an epimetabolome, that is a, a higher order uh, group of metabolites that are actually functioning in control of the post-translational modifications, all of these epiproteomic switches and indeed the epigenome as well. So the third principle is that it is the activation deactivation of these protein switches, which control the spatial temporal organization, as well as the function of these macromolecular systems. And then the fourth principle is that the entire redox system evolved to provide an adaptive network to respond to environment. So you can see this more I think more clearly by just considering the evolutionary perspective, um, multicellular animal life, the metazoans, evolved as a consequence of the evolution of oxygen into the atmosphere, the, the dramatic increase in oxygen in the, in the atmosphere about 700 million years ago. And so as a consequence of this, uh, you can actually see the multicellularity in terms of development that the multicellularity is really a redox driven and redox controlled process. Uh, we recently described this in a review on the redox theory of development. Many, many, many redox sensitive transcription factors. And <clears throat> thinking about this then in terms of a reproduction in a multicellular organism, reproduction became far more complex than just simply reproducing the genetic material because the organism has to go through an entire developmental sequence in order to reproduce. 
And so this means that we have redox networks that are responsive to the environment and change over life due to the, due to the exposures. And so we've talked about this quite a bit, discussed this quite a bit in our papers, uh, and I don't have time to discuss it, but it's very important that the, uh, the uh, networks are not static. They are in fact changing uh, with time. So I have just a couple minutes to finish up on the last topic, which is one of the things we're working on right now is this concept of antagonistic redox pleiotropy. Um, Antagonist pleiotropy, it's a genetics term, and it's the phenomenon that a single gene uh, can provide a trait that enhances fitness while also providing a trait that's detrimental to fitness. And some of our transcriptome metabolome data, uh, specifically a dose response study to manganese, where we were looking at the physiologic to toxicologic uh, transitions, uh, led us to uh, recognize that this is probably happening in redox systems. Uh, specifically, when we looked at the transcriptome metabolome interaction in this manganese model, we found that there were four communities uh, associated with uh, mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide, uh, oxygen consumption rate, uh, manganese concentration itself, as well as the cellular thiol systems. Uh, what was most um, provocative in looking at this was that the, when we looked at positive correlations in these communities and negative correlations within these communities, we found that they were effectively mirror images of each other. And when we went in to look at this in detail, uh, this is shown here only for manganese, but it's true for all, all four of these communities, is that each of the communities had many examples of opposing apparently opposing transcriptome metabolome responses. So it's the same exposure structure, but now completely opposite response structures. And so this leads us uh, to, you know, to where we are now in, in terms of thinking about this, because first of all, we don't know, but the question is, is this a universal characteristic of redox systems? And indeed, is this a an evolved characteristic of networks that do all networks really have in biological networks really have built in fail safe mechanisms that uh, provide the network stability. And I think this is really critical in terms of the therapeutics, uh, therapeutic development, because what this means is that the, the system is, is in fact evolved to uh, prevent us to be able to manipulate it to cure disease. So I think this is, it's an important concept to be, uh, to be thinking about. Anyway, to quickly summarize, um, the uh, first point is that uh, we, I didn't, obviously didn't show a lot of this data, but uh, we have a lot of data now ind indicating that the integrated metabolic protein and transcriptional network structures in multicellular animals really are a consequence of this evolution, the, the response to the increased atmospheric oxygen. Um, and I presented the redox code as a set of principles to guide the development of redox network models. And uh, thirdly, then uh, this important concept of antagonistic pleiotropy, uh, which if it's, uh, if it's general, it could serve to maintain stability in complex systems. And of course, also uh, create a roadblock to uh, interventions. Um, and I uh, think I'm there, I'm done on time. I didn't have an acknowledgement slide. There's too many people to acknowledge. So uh, I'm indebted to all of my colleagues and collaborators over the years. Thank you very much. This is also a wonderful ending slide that you are showing. Um, are there questions? Uh, yes, yes, we have one uh, by Bradley Maron. Uh, fascinating and excellent presentation, thank you. It is proposed that oxidant localization to different intercellular compartments is not homogeneous. How might dynamic distribution of oxidants within the cell affect the interpretation of thioloxidation networks? 
Okay, wonderful. It's, it's not a hypothesis. Actually, there's a lot of literature showing that the redox compartmentation in, in subcellular compartments is really very different. Mitochondria are uh, more reduced under normal conditions, but actually much more susceptible to oxidation under stress. Uh, very important. Uh, um, I think this is part of the adaptive structure uh, that um, in order to optimize functions, the peroxisome uh, contains hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so, so that protects the rest of the cell from high hydrogen peroxide concentrations. Uh, in the nucleus, uh, the, many of the transcription factors are redox controlled. And so uh, there are uh, specific transport systems which move thioredoxin, the reductant, into the nucleus under conditions of, uh, of signaling and transcriptional activation. So I think this is very important. I also think it is a, uh, uh, in some cases, is probably gonna be a druggable target because it is um, it is important. For instance, we found uh, both in uh, H1N1 influenza infection as well as in uh, RSV infection that uh, nuclear translocation of thyroidoxin potentiated the cytokine storm. And so these types of things, uh, it, it very well could be a, uh, a relevant to uh, network medicine. Uh, we might have room for another quick question. Uh, Dean, this is Joe. Th thank you for a terrific uh, talk. I, I, as I uh, was thinking about your presentation, it strikes me that um, that the, uh, the, the, the thiol redox modulation of protein function and presumably network activity is a sort of form, is not invariably, but often a form of allosteric modulation. We spend a lot of our time doing the sort of knockout experiment to sort out the importance of a, a gene or a protein. And yet we know that there are many, many different uh, versions of uh, more subtle regulation that uh, in a complex system conspire to create a phenotype that may not be easily predictable. Do you, would you agree with that or do you have a different perspective? Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I remember the very first uh, journal club uh, article that was presented on a knockout when we had years and years and years ago. And the remarkable thing when they showed the transcriptome array was that basically 20% of everything changed with that knockout. So yes, uh, the knockout is really a horrific uh, impact. And uh, if we change things in a more subtle sense, I believe it, it's real physiology and real pathology. And uh, the problem is it's a small effect size and it's much more difficult to, to tease that out. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there are no other questions, then we'll go on. Thank you, Dean, uh, to yeah. the next presentation. This is by Jörg Menke from the Max Brutz Labs at the University of Vienna. And Jörg will talk about visualizing networks. Okay, I hope you hear me now. Yes, we do. Um, I want to thank the organizers because this conference really feels like home and I'm very excited to present a project that we've been working on for the last five years that has now matured into a paper and share our vision for the future of network medicine, if you will, which in our hands looks <clears throat> something like this. So what we did is we built an, a virtual reality platform where you can really interactively explore genome scale networks. And in a couple of minutes, I'm also going to show you a live demo of it, but before that, I'd like to spend a little bit of time to explain to you why we think this is a good idea to begin with, why we think that visual interactive network analysis is so powerful. So here are just some examples of network visualizations that I'm sure many of you will immediately recognize. We start from um, this one showing the connection between network centrality and gene essentiality functional modules in genetic interaction networks, or more recently, very relevant and patterns of global epidemic spreading. And these and, and many other examples show that on one hand, important network characteristics can really often be recognized by eye. And also in turn, patterns that stand out visually often have a meaningful interpretation. 
Now, there are a few very critical limitations to network visualization, though. And the first one has been on my mind since I yeah, did network science in my PhD. This little co cool network I find shows friendships between high school students. And it's visually immediately obvious that uh, kids that have the same ethnic background actually tend to stick together. Now, in the review from Mark Newman, where I got this from, he writes the following, namely that we have no special reason to suppose that this very simple algorithm would reveal anything particularly useful about the network. And he does have a point, right? So why would I expect to learn something about a network by pretending that the nodes are somewhat negatively charged and edges represent springs? So ultimately, we cannot trust what we see. And the same is also true the other way around. Sometimes we cannot really visualize what we know is true. And this graphics is actually a nice example of that. So I, I made that as a postdoc years ago when I was still in, um, in Laszlo's lab. So we can prove analytically and statistically that these disease genes aggregate in local neighborhoods, but in a normal layout, they would just be all over the place. We cannot see that. So what I had to do is I had to draw these little modules in by hand. And finally, we know, you know the, the curse of the hairball, meaning that if networks are too big, they are just a mess and we don't see anything. So we would like to propose a solution to these challenges, and the solution has two components. The first one is a framework for interpretable network layouts. So this means that layouts where you really know what the node positions mean, and it also means where you can position them to reflect any network characteristics that you want in order to inspect it. And the second part of our solution is the um, VR platform where you can blow up this hairball to the size of the cathedral, if you like, and stand inside of it and look at all its details. So let's start <clears throat> with the first part. Our framework for this um, yeah, interpretable uh, layouts has four main steps. We start from the network, and I'd like to mention again that we really designed this in order to be applicable to genome scale networks um, that we are mostly interested in. We first convert this into a network or these networks into a feature matrix where every entry of this matrix describes the relationship between a pair of nodes. Now, obvious candidates for these relationships could be um, network distance, but it can be anything really. So you can choose any structural characteristic or also external functional annotations of the nodes. The framework is completely agnostic and flexible, allowing you to explicitly emphasize any characteristic that you would like to in the final layout. And I'll also give you some examples for that on the next slide. The layout itself, so the um, computation of node XYZ coordinates is done using dimensionality reduction on this pairwise feature matrix. And there has been a lot of progress in the field of dimensionality reductions. There is a range of algorithms available um, in any programming language that you like. They are well documented and, and well um, understood what they do. And importantly, they are fast. So they really allow us to lay out these large molecular networks um, that we have in mind. And finally, these dimensionality reduction techniques also offer different kinds of embeddings. So we can offer, uh, we can use standard um, 2D or 3D embeddings, but they also have more interesting ones where you can embed a network on a sphere or other geometries, which will be very useful actually for um, later on for mixing structural network characteristics and functional network properties, and also for putting them in the VR actually. Okay, so let's have a look at two simple model networks to get a feeling for what we can do with this framework. We looked at um, a grid, a cubic grid, and this Cayley tree. And um, I'm showing you three different layouts that were designed to emphasize different network characteristics. In this first one, the global layout, we use some yeah, random walk-based feature matrix that gives you a very fine-grained picture of um, pairwise network distances. So the results, somewhat as expected, they recapitulate quite nicely the global shape of these networks as we would have expected it. Now we can also produce very different layouts based on completely different network characteristics. So in this, what we call importance layout, we aggregate a number of um, different network centrality measures. So for the Cayley tree down here, we see 
now that um, the nodes are grouped by layer in this original layer. Or in the cube, the layout reveals that there were are particular groups of nodes that have equivalent positions in terms of their centrality. For example, all the corners of this cube are um, yeah, topologically equivalent, and there are any number of these equivalent groups in this network. A third example is um, what we call a local layout that emphasizes nodes that have shared interaction partners. And I like this one actually, because I've been working on, you know, on grids and networks for more than 15 years, but I actually never realized that grids are intrinsically bipartite. So only when I saw this layout, it's immediately obvious that you can um, separate a grid into bipartite networks, but it never really occurred to me. So it was a nice, proof of principle that after all these years, there's something to learn by looking at networks if you are able to emphasize specific properties um, explicitly. Okay, so let's move to molecular networks. On this side is what we would call a structural portrait of the interactome um, in the importance layout, meaning that node positions indicate their network centrality. It's a bit hard to see here, but we also highlighted um, on this layout essential genes. So if you see this blue shivering um, down here, this is actually the area where essential genes and high centrality genes go together. So by this aggregation, we can very clearly see a very you know, fundamental result in network biology, that is this correspondence between essentiality, centrality, and, and biological importance. On this side, we are showing something that we call a functional layout. So this one is based on um, node annotations, in this case on gene disease associations. And this one makes these disease modules that we've been talking about visible finally. So we can now really zoom in and inspect the interactions between individual disease associated genes and also interactions to the outside world. Okay, so the, the real power of this approach, we. I'd like to think of these as, as proof of concept, is when we mix functional and structural network properties, actually. And this can be very done very conveniently when you also use the third dimension. So when you go from these flat layouts to three-dimensional ones, and um, here's an example that we call a network landscape. This is the top view and the side view, though I don't actually really want to explain it because in this static 2D view on a slide, it, it's hard to do justice to it. So we made a web app where you, that would allow you to also explore the 3D nature of it in an interactive way. But of course, the real deal is when you can explore these large three-dimensional networks like this in VR and really in an immersed fashion. Okay, before I finally show you how this looks, um, I want to give you a brief overview of what our VR platform is doing. <clears throat> Here are yeah, a few of the major goals and design principles that guided us in our development of the platform. The first one is we wanted to be able to assess networks at all scales. So from individual nodes, their connections, but also their associated metadata, um, functional annotations, disease associations, you, you name it. We wanted to be able to look at and annotate um, clusters and their annotations all the way really to global network structures where we can see the um, relationships of individual nodes to the entire rest of the network. We also wanted to be able to explore different contexts within a network. For example, the same gene, um, the same set of genes that form a very cohesive, tightly connected functional cluster may actually be involved in very different diseases. So in order to um, switch between the two, we use these um, yeah, specific layouts that we developed before and implemented a dynamic transitioning feature that allows us to, to smoothly vary between different layouts and then observe where individual nodes or groups of nodes would go. And I'm also going to show this um, to you in a, in a few slides. Fundamentally, we really wanted to also not only look at networks. So we wanted to really analyze them in real time. So um, what we did is we implemented an analytics engine where the user can plug in his or her, or her own code. So using the favorite analysis and pipeline, say network X, but also other uh, 
um, non-Python based ones can be reasonably easily um, integrated into our platform. And to do this, we actually designed the entire platform in a very modular fashion meaning that there are different modules taking care of um, data storage, data analysis, and um, data visualizations. And each of these modules is implemented using very standard tools to make it accessible, um, as accessible as possible to um, programmers. Our platform runs on standard hardware. So if you can run a virtual reality game, then you can run our platform. Unless you want to connect it to a large database or a cloud computing platform, in order to really analyze big data, then you can also do that. And finally, while the overall design of our platform was really meant to be as generic and versatile as possible for any kinds of network, um, we have also implemented a very concrete proof of principle application showing that it is useful. And the application that we used is um, using an interactome network to prioritize genomic variants in rare disease patients. Okay, I understand that um, seeing is believing. Let's check it out. This is where I actually stand. So I'm in a, a green room right now that we built for experimenting with VR. And in principle, we can do also live streaming of um, VR content. However, this feature is still you know, somewhat experimental. There are a lot of moving parts. And um, to be really sure that it actually works, I cheated a little and pre-recorded this part yesterday so I'm just going to show you the video right now. That is me, and he'll start talking real soon. Okay, so when I put on this headset, I can see what you're seeing, except that I'm able to look around in it, whereas you see only the angle from a fixed camera position. So here on this side, we have the interactome in um, the disease layout that I introduced to you previously. So the first thing I want to do is I really want to go inside so that I can look at all the genes and all the clusters. So now these um, clusters, they correspond to the different disease modules, that is to the local interactome neighborhoods where an individual um, disease is located. And the first thing I would like to show you is how we use these transitioning features in order to switch between different contexts of genes. So whereas now um, the disease context is emphasized, I can transition to a functional layout that emphasizes the um, biological processes that genes and clusters thereof are involved in. And by following up on where individual genes go between disease and functional layout, I can get a sense of the relationships between um, yeah, functional perturbations and the disease consequences that arise from them. Okay, let's look at some of the features that our platform has. The first one I want to show is here on this side is where we have the um, inspection panel. So this one allows us to get basic information on what is the name of a particular gene, how many neighbors does it have, uh, which are known disease associations. And if I scroll down a little, um, I can also inspect what are expression levels in different tissues on this panel here. I also have, we have implemented um, a PubMed search for different articles and I can click on an individual article and I can read the abstract in order to learn a little bit more about individual genes, what they're doing and who they are. Here next to it is a particular panel that we have implemented for one specific application and that is for um, the prioritization of candidate genes of a rare disease patient. So here on this first tab, we see what are the phenotypes of the particular patient that we're looking at. Um, here, these are different candidate genes. This means genes where a variant was found in genome sequencing that um, is suspected to perhaps cause the disease. Here on this panel, um, we have different C genes, which are um, genes that are known to be implicated in similar phenotypes, in this case, um, different immunodeficiencies. And these panels here are the analytics panels where we can run a random walk with restart algorithm, which we can then also inspect the local neighborhood that is identified here. And we will, in fact, also use this panel to communicate, communicate with the non-VR world that we can look up um, afterwards. <laughs> 
All right. I want to show you one last thing, which is the disease-specific layout that we have implemented specifically for this case of rare disease variant prioritization, which looks like this. So once this transitioning has converged to the new positions, we will see um, four different spheres that arrange genes of different types. So here in the center, we have arranged the variants. These are the genes that we really want to inspect in detail. The second layer here are the um, genes known to be implicated in the similar disease phenotype. So this is the um, next closest important layer of relationships that we want to explore. And finally, on this outer layer is where we have arranged um, the nodes such that they reflect um, biological functions. And we can actually check what is the network context of individual variant genes by following up on its connections and seeing that this gene, for instance, is implicated in the regulation of chromosome um, organization or bone development. And this really helps in order to one by one inspect what is the context of these different genes and together with the algorithmical power um, that ranks genes according to their network um, closeness, we can really get quite fast, a quite accurate picture of what these individual gene defects might be doing or might not be doing. Okay, <coughs> that's all I wanted to show you for now. I hope you like it. <laughs> Indeed, <coughs> I hope I could at least you know, make you curious. Um, the paper should be coming out this week, I think, maybe next. Um, it comes with source code, it comes with a growing um, documentation, and we would be more than happy if many people would also try it out, and we also would be happy to help you set it up, a VR platform in your group, if you like. And with this, I'd like to thank the organizers again and um, so many people for tuning in. I'm looking forward to your questions. And when Once I have acknowledged the, uh, the people that actually do the work, the the interpretable layouts were done by um, Chris and Sebastian was driving the VR development, but there were also many other people um, involved in this. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, uh, Paula, do you want to ask uh, your question? Yes, I can. I can ask it directly. Uh, first of all, I think it's very impressive, really uh, a fantastic achievement. Um, I have a sort of technical question. Um, you say that uh, one of the, the technique that you are using to to favor visualization is is applying dimensionality reduction. Uh, but when you do so, what you do is actually to hide your original dimensions. So what happens when, 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 you, when you have to explain why two things are similar? Because now they are similar based on their embeddings, whatever um, spheric or, or planar embeddings. But you you lose the 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 the, the, the um, um, your original dimension. So how how can you cope with explainability? Unless you don't you don't focus yourself with a specific dimension. But how do you go about? Well, I think <clears throat> in our experience, um, the real usefulness is in exploring different context really. So of course, if you map a 20,000 dimensional um, gene ontology similarity feature vector to two or three dimensions, you lose a lot of information. Um, that said, if you can cross-reference, let's say the biological function with a disease association, with a network metrics. So if you are able to really explore different functional and topological characteristics, I believe in this changing of context is where you really learn something. Um, as for losing information as you move from very high dimensional spaces to two or three dimensions, there's really nothing we can do about it other than, um, well, knowing what the different limitations of these dimensionality reduction algorithms are, which in my mind is already much better than having to deal with trying to figure out what a spring algorithm would actually do. <laughs>
Good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jörg. That was uh, terrific. Uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, wonderful ways to think about these complex networks, both statically and dynamically. Uh, pre uh, we appreciate your pres presenting it to us. Laszlo asked if you would uh, share the link in the chat so, uh, so he and others can begin to explore it sooner rather yeah. than later if possible. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Great. The next presentation is by uh, Laszlo Barabasi from Eastern uh, Networks and the Fudo. Laszlo. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Joe. And uh, apologies for the for the echo that I generated. And uh, uh, your fabulous talk. Uh, and uh, it's hard to follow that uh, uh, that technology that you showed up uh, for us. So. Um, let me actually share my screen. I'm assuming you can see it now, right? And then let's go to the presentation part. And uh, <clears throat> and Joe, thanks for the fabulous conference and all the organizers for making this happen. We all wish we could have met in person, but I think this is as good a placement as it gets. I'm just going to miss the dinner after the conference. Uh, uh, so what, what I'd like to speak today a little bit is an ongoing work in my lab that is focusing on how do we bring food into the network medicine perspective. And it goes, that project goes under the, uh, the name of uh, Food Dome or the Dark Matter Nutrition in my lab. And, and you know, kind of the picture that I always start by network medicine talks is this one is that we want to understand how do we think about disease in terms of the underlying network that is, takes place within our cells. One of the things we need to realize that all of this information that this network relies on is really in a way comes from gen uh, genomics. But the question is how much we can rely on genomics alone to really understand how disease develops and eventually how to cure it. And one way to think about it is to take the top 10 uh, causes of diseases, uh, say in the US, and look at how much of that disease occurrence can be explained by the genetic risk, that is the genetic factors, at least that we can unearth right now. And when you look at the top 10 diseases that you see on this slide, you realize that a relatively small fraction of the disease occurrence can be really explained by the genetic factors, and always my colleagues from the genetics department and uh, others kind of always raise their hands and say, well, where is the rest? It's mostly environment. So the question is, what is that environment? And environment can have multiple factors, can be physical exercise, stress, uh, environmental effects and so on. But probably the biggest gorilla in the room is really food. That is fundamentally, you know, we are bombarding each of our cells on a daily basis with thousands and thousands of molecules through our eating patterns. And we said, okay, well, that's great. At the end, we eat chemistry, right? We eat chemical things. So somehow those chemical things must connect to the networks that we study in network medicine. So we said, let's go ahead and make that connection and try to encode the environmental effects, in this case, the role of the food, into the world network medicine framework. And, and it turns out that it is often possible because there are certain kind of pathways that have been very worked out and well understood of how, for example, certain eating patterns affect uh, uh, you know, disease occurrence. So let me just tell you one short story that is very highly studied, which is kind of why one of the reasons why red meat can actually contribute to uh, a heart disease in general. And you know, one mechanism has to do with the fact that red meat contains choline and L-carnitine, which if you do it, uh, in the, uh, the, it's being processed by the gut bacteria and then turn into TMA, which then take, is taken by our liver and turn into TMAO. And there is epidemiological evidence to show that people with high uh, elevated TMAO levels have 40% higher chance of dying with heart disease. But the story gets more interesting if you kind of factor in other foods that you can eat, because it turns out that you know, meat is a common staple food in say Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, eating patterns, which are one of the healthiest that we can uh, 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 use. Mm -hmm. 
And it turns out that they don't seem to lead to coronary heart disease in those cases. And one mechanism why that's not the case is that because meat in the Mediterranean food is often uh, paired with uh, garlic and wine and uh, olive oil, which contain allicin and DMV, that block the gut bacteria's ability to create TMA, and hence you don't get elevated TMA level. So the reason I want to tell this story is not as much for the chemistry that, uh, that takes place, but for the reason to say, okay, we have a well-defined pathway here, then let me just look up in my eating patterns when I have any of these chemicals. Hence, am I kind of at risk to have heart disease? And it turns out that if you look, start looking into the uh, dietary databases, that of the six chemicals involved in this pathway, only choline is tracked currently. And the remaining five uh, chemicals in this, involved in this pathway are undetected, meaning that neither as a scientist nor as a consumer, you can actually find evidence which of your food contain that. So that became very unexpected for us. And because if you want to really understand the role of the food on health, you need to know the chemicals that you are bombarded with on a daily basis. So we said, how much do we really know? How many chemicals really are in our food? And it turns out that there's quite a bit of knowledge in, the, in nutrition about that. And that is typically collected by USDA. And USDA tracks the concentration of about 150 ingredients in thousands of foods, I'm sorry, 100, 150 nutrients in thousands of ingredients. But when you look deeper, it turns out that there are about 20,000 different compounds that are no associated with the food that we eat. So 26,000 this number, depending on how you count. And so, and those are untracked, meaning that, you know, the, that it's very hard to find information how much of these 26,000 chemicals are found in the particular foods you eat. So for example, if you look at garlic per se, which contains allicin, USDA lists 67 compounds, but FoodDB, a database that collects from multiple databases uh, composition information, lists more than 2,300. Now, the question is, why don't we know what's happening with this large number of chemicals? Well, maybe they don't matter. And, you know, maybe they are just inert. They just go in and go out and they don't really contribute to our health. And for sure, the 150 nutrients are very important because they are essential for our health. They are the, they are the sugars, they are the fats, they are the many energy sources that we have to kind of consume on a daily basis to be alive. And the 26,000 or so actually, which we call the dark matter of nutrition, really contain many polyphenols, <coughs> flavonoids, and many, many other chemicals that on surface are not essential for, uh, for survival, but they play a very important role in health. How do we know that these play an important role in health? Is because when we actually queried the world scientific literature for connections between these chemicals and health effects, Yes, of course, the 150 nutrients are connected to 622 health effects, but about twice as many health effects were connected to the dark matter of nutrition. So one of the things we do in my lab uh, now is to really try to understand, <coughs> sorry, I went too fast, what kind of chemicals are in what kind of uh, uh, foods and to create an ultimate database that would map out the dark matter of nutrition. And here I'm just showing, for example, uh, some of the databases on which we rely and we combine and we use existing national databases. We also uh, use mass spec metals to kind of discover new chemicals as well as to confirm our predictions, as well as what we have a world program that tries to predict the chemicals that should be in the food and then use mass specs and other metals to test if we are right or not. My goal today, today, however, is to say, let's assume that we will have that information. How, what can we do with that? How can we connect the nutritional dark matter information to health effects? So that leads to network nutrition. And um, just this uh, month, actually last month, we had a paper <laughs> together with several people who are at this conference that where we try to actually connect the nutritional dark matter to network medicine. And the question is, how do we do that? and how do we approach that problem?
And this is a proof of principle, but we started with the smaller compounds. We started with polyphenols. And polyphenols, as you know, <laughs> are kind of very pleasant in mostly plants, fruits, and vegetables. And they have a beneficial role in health. And typically, they are believed to have their positive role in health through their antioxidant effect. So we were curious, how could we actually build the polyphenol story into the network medicine framework? What's special about polyphenols is that much of the effects they have, they don't achieve by taking place in the metabolism. So they're not processed by the human metabolism, at least most of them are not, but rather they, they, their role can, takes place through binding mechanisms. So they bind and they regulate processes within the cell. So the question was, how can we take the polyphenols and put them into this network for this framework that we've been developing for the last 15 years? And the picture is relatively simple, right? Uh, as I said, the, the polyphenols really have an effect through binding to proteins. So let's take, for example, a green tea that has EGGCG as the active ingredient. So we have to identify what are the targets of EGCG in this case, this, uh, this set, let's say that these are the targets. And then we need to find out what disease modules are in the right ne ne network neighborhood that may overlap with the polyphenol targets. And in this example, of course, disease A is overlapping and disease B, uh, the two disease Bs are not overlapping. And we use the human interactome for that, uh, as we normally do in other studies. And let me be much more specific. When it comes to EGCG, it has 52 protein targets. And, and it turns out that it significantly overlaps with uh, type 2 diabetes proteins. And this by no means surprising, because it's known that, uh, that tea consumption has actually a beneficial effect on diabetes. So, so, uh, so it's kind of confirms of what has been known previously about uh, the role of tea. But the question was, can we actually discover new information? So, uh, so what we did first is to kind of check how good our methodologies. And we started with EGZC. And then we said, what are the diseases that, that most like, that best overlap with the targets of this chemical, the active ingredient of tea? And it turned out that most of them that were ranked high by the network medicine framework, most uh, uh, phenotypes or diseases, are also to be known previously epidemiologically to be connected to uh, uh, consumption of tea. But we also predicted that these are the green, green ones up here, and we also predicted new therapeutic associations. So the interest now for us in this one, can we actually predict new associations and can we experimentally test that the mechanism through which that prediction takes place is valid? So we started with all the polyphenols for which we had target information. For not for all polyphenols, we know what are the human protein targets. And here I'm showing you a case study for three of them. And we focused on vascular diseases in general. So the, the pink notes are the vascular disease genes. And these are the targets. The three other colors are the targets of three polyphenols that are typical in our food. And what, you realize, what we realize is that these are all overlapping with vascular diseases, but they do so through very different mechanisms. Uh, you know, they, one of them affects signaling, the other one, the blood clot dissolution, and the third one, the platelet activation. And we ended up focusing on rosmaricic acid uh, because, because it kind of had a new mechanism that was kind of unexpected in this context. And Joel Oscazo's lab ended up uh, developing an experimental test for this hypothesis or for this prediction and uh, by effectively identifying what is the target of rosmaricic acid, which is FYN over here, and, and what proteins involved in platelet function that's interact with. And therefore, we could act, they could explicitly test how the increasing rosmaricic uh, acid concentration affects uh, the platelet aggregation and particularly whether the, the, the molecules that the maps indicated that to be involved are really expressed at the level that we expect them to do so. And to make a long story short, what we found actually is that, that indeed the mechanism that was predicted based on the network map was fully supported by the experiments. So why is this exciting for us? Because to best of my knowledge, this is the first case 
where network medicine has been used in a predictive fashion and then experimentally successfully tested to, in the, to really see the role of molecules that are otherwise are in the food on certain uh, processes that, that have a direct effect on the health. And I particularly like the fact that this is not happening through the metabolism, but it happens to binding to proteins and effectively affecting the cellular processes that we, we have developed so many tools in the context of the interactin for. And, and so let's see, where do we take this whole story uh, from here? So now that we have a proof of principle that this is a viable path forward, uh, one of the goals that we have in the lab is to take every single plant or every single food that we eat and get a, that, a, an inventory of what kind of chemical compounds are there, how many ideally quantified if it's possible. Like for example, when you look at sweet basil, there is evidence of more than 2000 chemical compounds, but only 146 are quantified. And the remainder, we just know that they are present, but we don't know how much of it is there. So we're developing tools to predict how much should be there in a particular plant, what is the expected concentrations and how much variability should be there. But we're also interested in how these compounds connect, whether they connect to flavor, whether they connect to disease occurrences or if they have any non-health effects. So to create effectual environment where we can really diagnose in depth the chemical composition of the food and its effect on health. And the goal why we want to do that is because we have this great kind of ambition to start with the eating patterns, which is really a set of dishes, right? And then eventually compose the dishes that we have into the ingredients, be that onion, for example, from hamburger, and then identify what are the chemical compounds of those. And then effectively identify what, where do those chemical compounds interact with the human interactome, whether they interact with the interactome or with the metabolome, and eventually what diseases they can cause. And of course, the mathematical challenge here is that the community has developed wonderful tools to look at one molecule and its impact on one particular disease. And that's exactly what we did in the case of the polyphenol. But here we have thousands of molecules that are simultaneously bombarding our cells. And they come in different concentrations and they affect different processes. And how do you really piece out which one is a dominant molecule? And that is an unsolved question for us. That's one of the things that keeps us awake to say, how do we combine all of this information together? But as we're trying to go there, you know, we ended up developing quite a number of tools to, to uh, march down on that path. We have knowledge graphs in the lab that, it, that try to identify the full body of knowledge, looking, linking food chemicals to wellness and disease. So we ended up reading the full literature digitally. We have tools to go deeper into particular chemical, we call it food mine, to identify, say, what's in basil. We think a lot as for food as drug, right? And to identify food molecules that may have beneficial health effects. Down the line, we want to think about food and drug interactions. You know, what kind of chemicals in the food affect the efficacy of a particular drug? And obviously, all of this done in the context of network medicine, right? Is that uh, the network medicine is the tool or the platform on which all of this disparate information can be linked together and can be connected in a predictive fashion to health. And of course, we have quite a bit of thinking in the lab on, about processed food to understand how processed food is different from the naturally occurring food and why does it have such as exceptional health effects and eventually how could we compensate that. And we ended up publishing in the last years a few papers on that, uh, uh, on this uh, about the journey, starting with kind of the vision of it of the nutritional dark matter in the first issue of Nature Food. Yes, there is such a journal as Nature Food, and I think it will be a great place for the network medicine community as well for those who want to explore the role of food, <laughs> all the way to actually to the recent paper that we just published last month about uh, the laurel polyphenols uh, uh, and kind of through network medicine to understand that. And finally, I will add with the, and with, the, with our team, uh, Julia Manichetti has been leading actually our food home team, but Italo De Valle has actually led the polyphenol project. 
and many others are supporting and uh, also, and we have great help from Darius Mozarafian and Walter Willett and not to mention Joel Oscazo who has been part of this fabulous journey. I have some disclosures here, but, and, uh, and finally, uh, I wanna thank you for having me here and delighted to have answer any questions you may have about this work. Thank you, Laszlo. Uh, are there any questions? It is another fantastic talk and really open new avenues for our health. And it was also extremely clear. So personally, I have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me ask a question uh, concerning uh, variability of food. You're, you're talking about the uh, processed food as, as one uh, aspect, but of course, it's very important whether the seasonal uh, growth of foods and uh, uh, how the foods are produced. And so how does this affect the food uh, content and, and the nutritional uh, impact of that? Is, is there any, uh, have you been able to put this into, the, into your uh, formulations? Uh, Dean, I'm so sorry. Maybe because there's a big Verizon truck in front of my house. Yeah. I lost half of their question from the okay. variability on. Would you mind repeating it? I can come back. So foods are very different uh, mm -hmm. depending upon the season as well as location of growth. And so yes. this, is, this is a horrendous problem that we've addressed when we've done yes. food, food chemistry. Yes, so you are absolutely right. And we have done quite a number of studies ourselves, first by collecting from the literature, say lots of different type of carrots measurements. And uh, also USDA now in the newest database actually does give us the information about the multiple repeats of the measurements. So we have quite a bit of control about what is variable and what is not. Uh, and what is the law of variability? And uh, Julia Manichetti, who is actually here at this conference, she's been actually leading an effort in my lab to mathematically describe this degree of variability. And this is about an order of magnitude, but the variability follows a very precise mathematical law. And what is beautiful about that is that using this mathematical law, we can actually now estimate how much should be of a certain chemical in any kind of food where it's not quantified. And the simple way to think about it is you cannot just produce a certain chemical 10 times more than how your energy, how your metabolism is running at that moment. So there are deep, deep correlations between the concentrations of multiple chemicals because the same machinery is generating that. And we can actually exploit that to predict and to experimentally test the variability uh, across different foods of, of one particular chemical. Yeah, that's fabulous, thank you. Thanks very much, Laszlo. I think we're gonna have to move on and maybe Clemens, you could save your question for the end. We'll have a little time for broader discussion then. Uh, and our last speaker for this session is Istvan Kovash from Northwestern, who's in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And he'll talk about predicting signed interactions including drug combinations and genetic interactions. Yes, Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. We had a number of fantastic presentations about uh, large-scale networks that are relevant for network medicine. One common feature or actually problem with all these large-scale data sets is that they are incomplete. And that's an inherent property of any large-scale data set. Not, this is not specific to network medicine. And I'm going to show you a few examples today of how we, how we can go around this problem and, and try to uh, utilize the fuel power of network medicine concepts. Because right now we believe that it's uh, very much limited by the quality and the incompleteness of the available data set. So that's the focus of my presentation. And as you could see from Laszlo's uh, presentation, um, one well-known example is protein-protein interactions. And the one thing that we shouldn't forget that even though this is a relatively small network compared to some other networks that you might see in the next few days. Uh, this is already a huge network in the sense of uh, uh, having 200 million pairs that you should test experimentally. If you really want to go uh, after all the potential protein-protein interactions, even if you just consider one protein for each gene. And if you take into account 
mutated versions of the proteins or multiple different uh, uh, potential proteins uh, associated to the same gene, the search space is even larger. So really what we see when we look at these networks in any way is just the tip of the iceberg. And that is something that's common between this data set and many other data sets that you care about, even if you are studying brain networks, for example. So um, from a network point of view, you might think that, oh, this problem is already solved. If you search for it, you will see that uh, there are a number of different techniques out there to, to provide you um, to, to solve this problem. And we call this link prediction or network inference. So but just by studying the patterns in an incomplete data set, you can, in principle, predict which other links are out there. and uh, which ones should you really believe? And the, the, I showed you several methods on the previous slide. So the common theme, the common idea behind most of these is coming from social network studies. The idea is that if you and me have many friends in common, we are more likely to be friends. And this all makes sense also for proteins. So if you have two proteins that have nothing in common, they don't share any of their partners, they're probably less likely to interact than, than two other proteins that share most or all of their partners because that might imply that they are expressed in, in the same locations at the same time. They might be involved in the same biological function, pathways. So they're expected to be more likely to interact. So this all makes sense. And uh, for, for decades in the literature, we've followed the pipeline where you try to quantify network similarity. How many partners do two proteins share? There are different ways to do this. Mathematically, I don't want to get into the details. Uh, it doesn't really matter for for protein protein interactions which of the previous methods that I highlighted you pick. Here is a simple example: the relative fraction of shared partners compared to the total number of partners of two proteins. If it's approaching one, the two proteins are really very similar, and you expect them uh, to be interacting, right? Based on the traditional social network concept. So you will you will come up with those pairs as your top predictions, and then the usual way to validate these predictions is that you check if those predictions make sense. So how can we do that? The traditional way is to check if those two proteins that you are predicted that they should interact based on your network methodology, you check if they're really biologically similar. Are they involved in the same gene ontology terms, in the same pathways? Do we know that there is, they have something in common in terms of biological similarity? The problem with this pipeline though, is that you are not really testing if your predictions are correct. You are just testing if network similarity is really a good way to quantify biological similarity. And we know that it is, right? So we don't have a perfect formula to quantify network similarity. There are dozens of different ways to do that, but they all seem to correlate really nicely with biologic notions of biological similarity. But is this really capturing what we wanted to do uh, to infer missing connections? And uh, in order to do that, um, you, you need to do case studies and, and really understand the budget of what's going on. So I will just show you one example where this might be a wrong idea to follow. So here are two proteins on the left and on the right. They're very similar. They have the same interface and they are, they are known to interact with a number of partners through the same interface. So based on the traditional natural concepts, you would expect them to be interacting with each other, right? because they have a lot in common. But in fact, they cannot really interact. They can interact with other proteins that have a matching interface, but they can't interact with another protein that has the same interface, right? So, so following the usual idea that similar proteins, or similar nodes in a generic network are more likely to interact gives you valuable predictions, but it also gives you tons of false positives. And there's a fundamental reason. The reason is that um, similarity is not the only way how proteins can interact or nodes in biological networks can interact. Homophily is not the only organizing principle. You know, interactions are also developed through complementarity, like key lock mechanisms. And that is not captured by the original framework. And what we proposed uh, now two years ago, it has been published two years ago, is the, to, to go beyond this mathematically and try to find a concept that works, no matter uh, how you find your partners. So no matter if you, if you select your pick your partners based on similarity or complementarity, we wanted to come up with a mathematical framework that can provide meaningful predictions without false positives either way. And there's a simple way to do that. And it's illustrated here with the blue line. So if two proteins are really 
similar to each other, and you know an additional partner for one of them, for the green protein on the left, then you might expect that to be shared as well. So really the, the fundamental mathematical concept illustrated here is that if you try to predict missing interactions in a complex network based on similarity, you might fail. But if you predict a new partner based on its similarity to your existing partners, then that is going to work either way. No matter if you connect to similar proteins or dissimilar proteins, this concept of finding someone who is similar to your existing partners is expected to work in all networks. And uh, so here is just an example where we really expect that the blue link is more likely to be there than the red one. And you can capture this very simply by following paths of length three. So you can see that if you if you go from the protein on the right, uh, let me illustrate this. So from here, you jump once, you get to any of these guys in the middle, you jump twice, you get to usual similarity-based predictions following paths of length two in the network, and you need to jump more. Uh, so find similar proteins to your partners. So one extra step is needed. So three steps altogether to find good candidates. And, uh, and that is indeed working. And uh, if you look at the traditional concept of do similar proteins interact or not, you would really expect a nice positive correlation between the number of shared partners and the chance that two proteins are really interacting. And you see the opposite in most data sets. So this is not really working at the large scale. But if you look at this new idea, of following paths of length three, you see a beautiful, nice positive correlation. And here we are just testing if, if we are not doing any predictions at this point, we are just testing if, if what are the patterns in the data set, right? And you could do this in any data set that you like and check which idea works better. And what we believe uh, based on mathematical reasons and our intuition is that the, the blue idea of following Pass of length three is always expected to work better. And uh, we tested this experimentally in a collaboration between the Barabashi group in Lasto and, and, and Mark Vidal. And it was an overwhelming success. So you can indeed use um, this idea of counting paths of length three between pairs of proteins to find new interacting pairs of proteins that are seemingly as good as the known pairs that, that we started with. And uh, um, there is a deeper mathematical reason why this concept works. I won't get into abstract mathematics here, but we really believe that if you give me give us an incomplete network, we can now do a better job than what the field could do for decades in terms of figuring out what is missing from there. And the, the key point that I was hoping to focus today is what if you have signs? So in regulatory networks, in brain networks, in many cases, you not only have weights, but you also have signed interactions, inhibitory, excitatory interactions, and so on. That makes life more complicated. And the, there are additional complications. So in addition to missing links, we actually have false positive, so there's noise in the data sets, there are biases, and this is what we are working on currently in, in, in my group, to, to try to design a framework that can solve this problem at this level of complexity, taking into account not only the network that we have, but also information about biases and noise. And uh, there are not many examples right now where you can not only download your network, but you can also download some information about the noise inherent to this network or the or the biases in some quantified way. So one nice example is the genetic interactions in yeast that have been almost completely mapped out and the parts that are missing. So the, the knowledge biases are well known. That's what you can see in the middle, uh, interactions that couldn't be mapped for technical reasons. And we also know for each interaction how noisy they were. So it's the, you not only have a network of interactions, you also have a network of noise. So you, really, you need to take into account like three different networks, the, the graph, the biases and the noise to really go after this problem and solve it in a meaningful way. And that's what we are working on. But I won't go into too much mathematical details on that. Let me just show you some illustration of why we expect this to work and why this is cool. So if you haven't heard about genetic interactions, uh, this is just a situation when combined mutations in two genes lead to some unexpected phenotypes. So, um, if, if you measure fitness of, uh, of single mutants or double mutants, uh, the combined impact of two mutations would, would be just the product of the two individual fitness values. And if you see a significant deviation, we call it a genetic interaction. A well-known interesting example is synthetic lethality, where you can lose either gene one by one without a significant uh, effect on the fitness or without killing the cells. But if you lose both genes at the same time, 
it, it kills the cells. So it, it, it's a little condition if you have both mutations. And uh, in yeast, we have an almost complete map. So you can test different ways to predict missing data and validate it from the same data set. And we can even do follow-up experiments. So uh, if you don't care that much about yeast, let me just mention that genetic interactions are also important in humans. And there are well-known examples in cancer, for instance, where, where this has been utilized already. So here, here's an example of BRCA1, another gene. PARP1, and there is a genetic interaction between them, a negative genetic interaction, a synthetic little connection, which means that if both of the genes are missing from a cell, then that cell is most likely to die. And this can be used to actually cure cancer in some patients, because uh, BRCA1 is mutated in, in, in the cancer cell lines, it's, it's not mutated in, in the rest of your body. And if you take a drug targeting the other gene, ARP1 in this example, then you lose both genes in the cancer cell line. So those cells are expected to die. While in the rest of your body, you only lose gene A, so which, which is not as bad. So those cells are mostly expected to survive. So if you know genetic interactions, especially synthetic little or negative genetic interactions in humans, that gives you a tool to, to, to actually cure diseases, right? Obviously, real life is more complicated. A third gene might change the picture, and this is known. You can find therapeutic biomarkers. So high-order genetic interactions, epistasis is important. And that's one of the aims that we are heading towards to, to predict those as well, not just describe pairwise genetic interaction networks, but go and explain what happens if you take into account the third or fourth gene as well. And uh, um, so, so these concepts have been already proven in humans, but I'm just going to show you that uh, what we can do in yeast for now. Again, we need to depart from the usual idea from social networks and we try to predict missing interactions that your, the enemy of your enemy should be your friend. Enemy here is a negative interaction, friend is a positive interaction if you'd like. And what we really need to do is to follow the same steps than what we did uh, for protein interactions and take into account paths of length three. And you, that way you can predict not only the existence, but also the sign of missing interactions. And this works remarkably well. So we have over 90% precision in terms of predicting existence or sign in genetic interactions at the pairwise level. And this is much better than what you can do based on traditional social network ideas that I, that I briefly covered. And you can even go beyond this. It's, it gets very technical and predict uh, higher order genetic interactions. So what happens if you mutate a third gene? And preliminary results indicate that we we can predict at least half of the signal that's out there, even in this very large complex search space of triple mutants. So the last thing I wanted to, to briefly cover is that, that uh, there are ongoing studies in humans. So we are heading there and uh, pretty soon we can predict relevant genetic interactions for, for cancer, for instance, in humans based on these recent experimental advances. And the same mathematics applies also if you care about drug combinations. So. If you think about pairwise drug combinations, they can be also positive or negative depending on the combined impact, whether it's good for the patient or bad for the patient. And, and based on, depending on your input data, you, you, we, we are developing several techniques right now to, to, to predict what happens if you take two drugs together or three drugs together. And uh, the, the most straightforward way to do this is to take the existing knowledge about adverse drug interactions and, and synergistic drug combinations and follow the same steps than what we did for genetic interactions. And it seems that we can predict uh, the, the sign of a, of a new drug combination, whether it's good or bad for a patient in 99% accuracy. So this is where we are. And uh, if you would like to you know, collaborate in any of these directions, please contact us. We are very much looking forward towards testing these ideas in other applications. And just to connect to last week's presentation, obviously we need to eventually take into account environmental impact uh, and uh, you know conditions in general, and that is actually the same mathematics than what you require to understand how three mutations combine. So, so one mutation, one condition, one drug together is the same mathematics than combining three drugs or three mutations or two mutations and one drug. So once we have this framework, we are, we are really looking forward to many applications here. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope you have some time for questions. Um. Yes, um, signed networks are, are a very powerful tool.
uh, but it's not very easy to, to have realistic models of, of negative interaction. Yes, we discussed this is fun sometimes. Uh, the, the, the example for drugs is clear because you have knowledge of adverse drug reactions, but it is much more difficult to have some, some kind of model of non-existing interactions, for example, in the interactome. So okay. how... Yeah, indeed. Thank you for pointing that out. So in some sense, uh, we have an easier <laughs> life uh, when we try to go after more complex biology, like genetic interactions or, or drug combinations than what we started with in, in terms of protein-protein interactions, because we really don't have much reliable information, or unbiased reliable information about which proteins do not interact, right? And uh, you would ideally need that to develop machine learning frameworks or any network medicine-based framework to solve our current problems. So, and uh, it was surprising to us that if you make your life a bit more complicated, you in include directionality, weights or signs in the problem, suddenly you, you get better results. Uh, and that's because you are really better capturing the full complexity of biology this way. Thank you, Sman. So Ishvan, if I may, uh, uh, you know, there has been quite a bit of work in the literature using gene expression data to extract signs. And you, if I am right, you are just purely ex extracting that from the network topology. Have you tried to compare that or, or is there, what, is this a completely different way of thinking about that? So thank you, thank you for bringing that up, Laszlo. So we haven't tried uh, comparing what we do with uh, with uh, science inferred from gene expression data. That 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 sounds like an interesting thing to try. I uh, so here when we when we talk, I, I guess you were thinking about genetic interactions, right? Or or inner anyway. I mean, normally yeah, anyway. when people start talking about science in regulatory settings, in other settings, is often there are quite a number of tools in the literature to extract that uh, from, but it's all from gene expression data, right? Yeah, so so yeah, that's that's indeed a big field. We, we haven't explored that that direction uh, yet. Uh, um, actually, yeah, it, it, is, it is a bit more direct to, to deal with uh, genetic interactions or drug combinations because you directly obtain the, from the measurements, from the data, the signs themselves. It's not something that you infer based on statistics from the data, right? So it is also easier to go after these predictions uh, in with follow-up experiments to some extent because you can directly test the sign. You don't need to do a large number of studies and do statistics and to go after that. So this is just the starting point of it here. And we are really looking forward to exploring what you brought up, like the expression data as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's when the... Um... Well, the complementarity principle, of course, makes good sense, but there are uh, likely to be, in fact, there are significant differences in weighting the interactions across species, right? Even among some of the best orthologs. And uh, uh, does that, tell, tell, have you thought a little bit about what the sort of uh, the sensitivity analysis is around that point? Uh, what, what are the ranges of KD similarities, for example, that would allow you to predict most accurately uh, the, uh, the power of the interaction in whatever the phenotype is. Thank you, Joe. That's a fantastic question. We, I, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately, right? So, but this is really the elephant in the room. So, so we, uh, even at the natural level, we don't have a well established way of measuring similarity and really quantifying similarity, right? If you are talking about extremely similar proteins, it's a clear cut story, but uh, anything in between in the middle of the spectrum, it depends on which methodology you're using. So, so uh, life would be much more easy if, if we had a clear cut way, mathematically a good solution to measure natural similarity, and then we could compare that to biological similarity measures, but we are not yet there, unfortunately. So. Let's see how, how soon we can get there. Thanks. Sure. Well, I think we have, uh, thank you very much, Istvan. We have uh, about 10 minutes left for other general questions or questions of any of our speakers. I know I had to cut off some question, some questioners as uh, we were moving through the agenda for which I apologize, but now we have time to follow up on that. I know that Clements had a question for Laszlo and uh, Feishong had a question for John that uh, we didn't get to. So uh, Clements, do you want to ask Laszlo your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, great talks all. And um, I, I'm nutrition scientist working also with metabolic networks. So I was very interested in your talk, Laszlo. Uh, 
And I was wondering, like in nutrition science, like we started kind of with nutrients, but we moved towards whole foods and diets. And um, also like your introductory example pointed out that it sometimes is about the combination of foods that you consume. And I wanted to ask you if you see like uh, a place for network analysis in, in dietary pattern analysis and um, combination either of foods or um, also dietary patterns in, in terms of which foods are consumed together uh, throughout the day. So what, what's your thinking about applying network analysis in that space? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, to some degree, we did think a lot about that, to be honest. And uh, we just had a paper uh, with, uh, uh, with Joe and many others from the School of Public Health reanalyzing to some degree the nurses' data. And that was all kind of part of the kind of going in that direction, developing kind of food was uh, approaches. And we, I just spent this morning, as a matter of fact, working in a, <clears throat> in a work with uh, that Julia is heading on the, on looking at the health impact of ultra processed food. And <clears throat> so uh, th there are different challenges, right? So, so one challenge is how you actually do epidemiology when there are so many different foods are being consumed together. And to some degree, of course, your community has some handle on that. And then, of course, the other challenge that I think we don't have an answer to is how do you do that in a network medicine setting when, when you are exposed to 10,000 molecules a day with different concentrations and they all have complementary, some kind of complementary effect and which one is winning and which one is ir irrelevant. And I think this second one is the one that keeps me awake in the sense that this is a very unsolved problem. Let me just give you some idea. I mean, we have, as, as Ishvan has spoken about and others as well, we now have pretty good tools of looking at drug combinations, which would be the equivalent in looking at nutrient combinations, right? <laughs> so we could do network medicine there. But when we go beyond two, we are lost. So, so that's the challenge for us. How do we do that? How do we develop the, the statistical tools to look at a thousand molecules at the time and their health effects? And uh, it's, it's an ongoing process for us. We have somebody in the lab uh, uh, who's thinking about it, but we don't have answers. Thank you. Great, and Feishan, do you want to ask uh, John your question? John Quackenbush. You know, thanks, Jim, for the beautiful talk about the gene regulatory work. So we know now we have more, you know, you know, special, you know, single cell and, uh, you know, bulk transcription data available. So my question is, do you have any suggestion about, you know, special, you know, gene regulatory network in, you know, cell type or tissue specific manner? Is John still on the uh, call on the Zoom? <clears throat> well, maybe we could pass that along to Kim. Uh, Kim Glass, can you answer that, Kim? Sure, I, I can do my, my best uh, pass. I mean, obviously my talk did talk uh, quite a bit about looking at networks in different tissues. And we've also started to think about how to apply some of the approaches we have to single cell data. Um, but like you mentioned, and uh, a, a lot of it is really just how do you understand the nature of single cell data, the, the sparsity issues, and what does sparsity represent? Is it the fact that a gene is not measured or is it the fact that a gene is not expressed? And so we've been working on actually adapting the Linus approach to instead of reverse engineering networks for individual samples, um, take something like a single cell data set and use the yeah, I'm sorry about that. I just logged off and got back on. Fei Chang, uh, why don't you send me a message in the chat and we can talk together sometime. Yes, thank you. I apologize. No, no. Well, any other comments or questions? Yeah, uh, so uh, Joe, let me ask a general question. I'm not sure who's best to uh, comment on this, but one of the things that has, um, is that uh, really uh, Laszlo touched on is that we don't have a lot of useful information as far as the transporter uh, regulation on everything, because that's Im obviously important in terms of the food, what's absorbed, and then what is 
cleared from a first pass effect in the liver. But the reality is uh, most of our network and modeling and examination ignores the fact that the transport is really limiting in terms of a lot of biology. And so what are the thoughts as far as being able to really bring uh, the transport as regulatory sites or control sites into our network models? Well, maybe I could start uh, the answer to that question because I've been thinking about it a little bit the last few months in discussions with Julia. Um, you know, the, uh, from first principles, you can argue that the cellular transporters, membrane transporters are absolutely essential because if there were no saturation, you'd quickly overload a cell if it got into an environment in which there were an excess of some metabolite that could uh, undoubtedly have some adverse or likely have some adverse consequences. So there needs to be a sort of finely tuned or reasonably finely tuned regulation of ranges of concentrations of any small molecule that can be taken up by a cell or by an organism more broadly. So it's a sort of an initial condition, a constraint for any dynamic modeling that we need to know more about that, uh, uh, that, that maximal uptake uh, and where it saturates over whatever range of concentrations a cell or an organism may be exposed to. So I agree with you. I, I think it, it really gets at uh, the broader issues of uh, what accounts for the reasonably narrow range of metabolites in any metabolic network that you can encounter in a cell across species. While there's a wide range across different metabolites among each, within each metabolite, the range is well-defined as Laszlo hinted at when he was discussing the variability, the coefficient of variation. So, um, so I, I agree, there are very few, uh, at least I'm not aware of any uh, metabolic network analysis that regularly incorporates the issue of transport in part because we don't have all the rate constants either. But it seemed like the pharmacologic approach uh, might be because some of those uh, drugs are actually very specific on transport functions. And that, that might be a class of drugs that could give us some insight into that. You know, just uh, the you know, just thinking about that, uh, the talk on the pharmacokinetics. Yes, agreed. Any other comments, Vaisla? I I think you kind of covered as much as we can at this stage. All right, great. Well, pa Paula and I would like to thank all of the speakers for a terrific first session. I think we have a, an hour break now until twelve thirty for. Um, for lunch or dinner, depending upon where you are. And uh, we'll start promptly at 1230 with the next session on disease phenotyping. Uh, you can certainly keep the link open to make it easier and uh, we'll see you in an hour.